Yes, Mr Costello. Commissioner, we now move to the final topic in uh, this part of the life insurance section of the module, which is group life insurance, before moving to the next case study. Um, there are some statements that need to be tendered and some explanation given of the work that has been done by the Commission in the lead up to these hearings. <coughs> Commissioner, an important feature of the Australian life insurance market is that life, total and permanent disability and income protection insurance are sold on both an individual and a group basis. The majority of life insurance policies are held within superannuation funds. In its recent draft report, Superannuation Assessing Efficiency and competitive Competitiveness, the Productivity Commission stated that 12 million Australians have one or more forms of life insurance through their superannuation. By way of contrast, ASIC Report 498, Life Insurance Claims and Industry Review, states that in 2015 there were 4 million retail policies and 3.9 million direct or non-advised policies of life insurance. A 2016 report prepared by Rice Warner states that the proportion of total life insurance held within superannuation funds <coughs> at that time was 71% for death cover, 88% for total and permanent disability cover, and 59% for income protection cover. In 2016-2017, Australians paid a total of more than $9 billion in group life premiums. Yet the recent Productivity Commission draft report states that about a quarter of members do not know if they have or if they are paying for a policy of group life insurance. The structure for group life insurance involves a policy owner holding a policy on behalf of a defined group of individuals. The most common group schemes are employer schemes and superannuation schemes. In this part of the hearing block, we will deal only with superannuation group schemes. Superannuation fund schemes are structured on the basis that the life insured is a member and beneficiary of a trust fund and the policy owner is the trustee of the fund. It is the policy owner in group schemes, not the life insured, who enters into the contract is obliged to pay the premium, has standing to claim and is entitled to receive the benefit amounts paid by the life insurer. The Commission requested information in connection with group life insurance from 15 superannuation trustees. In effect, those entities represent the five largest retail trustees measured by number of members, some of whom conduct their operations through more than one legal entity, and the five largest industry funds. The 15 selected entities include the 10 largest funds by member in the country. Information was sought for a five-year period from 1 July 2013 to 30 June 2018, which I'll refer to as the relevant period. Two entities, REST and AMP, will be the subject of case studies in this round of hearings. The solicitors and counsel assisting have carefully reviewed all of the responses received from superannuation trustees, and I will now give an overview of the responses of some of the entities that will not form part of the case study. We begin by making some general observations about insurance management frameworks, selection of insurers, and the roles of third parties in connection with group life policies and claims. The Superannuation Industry Supervision Act requires the trustee of a superannuation fund to formulate, review regularly and give effect to an insurance strategy for the benefit of beneficiaries. The insurance strategy must address the kinds, levels, basis and method for insurance to be offered or acquired on behalf of beneficiaries, the cost of offering or acquiring insurance and to do everything that is reasonable to pursue an insurance claim for the benefit of a beneficiary if that claim has a reasonable prospect of success. Since the 1st of July 2013, APRA has required superannuation trustees to have an insurance management framework that includes an insurance strategy under Prudential Standard SPS 250, Insurance in Superannuation, a Prudential Standard that has the force of law. Each entity examined by the Commission had in place an insurance management framework which included an insurance strategy as required by Prudential Standard SPS 250. 
Each of the entities confirmed in statements to the Commission that their respective insurance management frameworks have been reviewed internally on an annual basis. The entities also confirmed that their respective insurance management frameworks undergo or have undergone an independent review at least every three years. The Commission requested that for any group life policy entered into for members during the relevant period, each entity identify the insurer, when the insurer was chosen, any other insurers considered, to explain the process by which the insurer was chosen and explain the reasons the insurer was selected. In general terms, for entities that hold insurance through related parties, the selection and review processes explained in the statements to the Commission appear less rigorous than those described by entities that hold insurance through non-related parties. Most related party insurers do not involve a tender process, although some involved external review of some kind. An example of a more rigorous process was set out in the statement provided by Sunsuper, which describes the process of selecting the group life insurance provider for its Sunsuper for life product, which accounts for 82% of Sunsuper members. The current insurer was selected through a full market tender in 2010 with the assistance of an independent external actuary. Seven insurers were considered. Each insurer presented a tender document responding to selection criteria, with each insurer then scored against the criteria. Sunsuper conducted site visits to a short list of four insurers and received revised tender documents. An insurer was then selected. Sunsuper has since conducted two pricing reviews in relation to group life insurance with that insurer. The Commission also put questions to each entity concerning the types of insurance offered to members, the extent life insurance was taken up by members, the extent of any rebates received from insurers, and the extent to which the trustee had misinformed members in relation to the group life policy. The Commission also put questions to each entity about two types of clause sometimes found in life, TPD or income protection insurance. The first such clause is where coverage discontinues if a member's superannuation balance falls below a minimum level. We refer to these as prescribed minimum balance clauses. The second type of clause is one that requires a particular employ employment type or a minimum number of hours to be worked to maintain one or more forms of life insurance coverage. We refer to these clauses as prescribed employment status clauses. I will now outline some of the responses to the Commission's questions about those issues from particular entities, commencing with the retail funds. Belinda Howes provided a statement on behalf of three entities, BT Funds Management Limited, BT Funds Management Number no. 2 Limited, and Westpac Securities Administration Limited. The percentage of fund members who paid for group life premiums varied between the three funds. The highest take-up was in the retirement wrap fund in which 54.2% of members had funds deducted for group life premiums. The lowest was the Beacon superannuation plan where only 4.3% of members took up group life insurance. As to the specific types of clause I have already mentioned, Ms Howes stated that during the relevant period, she was not aware of any members that have been denied an insurance death or TPD benefit claim by reason of the fact that the member's account balance was below a prescribed minimum balance. Ms Howes noted that, with limited exceptions, when a balance is not enough to pay premiums, members are not provided with insurance cover. Ms Howes was also not aware of any circumstances where members or beneficiaries have been denied a benefit <coughs> under a life insurance or TPD policy or have received a reduced benefit by reason of the fact that the member did not have a prescribed employment status. Having said that, a member's entitlement to a TPD benefit within one of the BT funds will be affected by their ability to engage in activities of daily living. In general terms, a TPD benefit will be payable where, in the opinion of the insurer, the member is unlikely to ever follow their usual occupation 
or an occupation they are suited for by reason of their education, training and experience. In addition to this, the member must satisfy one of the further list of criteria. For example, a member must continuously and must be continuously and totally unable to perform at least two of the following activities, bathing, dressing, eating, toileting, in order to be eligible to claim. In relation to income protection insurance, Ms Howes was not aware of any circumstance where a member or beneficiary was denied a benefit under an IP insurance policy by reason that the person did not meet a prescribed employment status requirement. Ms Howes does note in a statement that to be eligible for income protection insurance, a member must work at least 15 hours per week on an initial assessment. At a latter point, any income benefit paid will relate to the income a member is earning prior to their illness or injury. Finally, part-time employees, casual employees and contractors may be covered for income protection insurance, but only for a period of two years. In regards to rebates and profit sharing, Ms Howes also disclosed that BT was party to an arrangement with a third party insurer, pursuant to which it receives payments described as a variable profit share and a fixed profit share. As examples, in 2017, BT received over $9 million with respect to the arrangement and in 2018, over $4 million. Ms Howes stated that the trustees received administration payments from the insurer AIA from 1 July 2013 until 31 December 2017 and from Westpac Life Insurance Services Limited from 1 January 2018. Ms House stated that the trustees received these payments for their own benefit. The value of the arrangements has not been disclosed to the Commission. Ms Howes also identified various instances where the trustees had communicated with members in a way that did not accurately reflect the terms of the group life policy. Many of the disclosed instances involve large groups of members being misinformed. For example, in September 2017, 18,027 members were incorrectly advised about premium payments. Investigation and remediation in relation to this and other incidents is ongoing. Commissioner, I tender the statement of Melinda Suzanne Howes, dated 31 August 2018, in response to rubrics 632, 633 and 634. That will become Exhibit 6.211. Thank you, Commissioner. Turn now to the Commonwealth Bank of Australia. <coughs> Witness statements were provided by three ent entities ultimately owned by the Commonwealth Bank of Australia. Colonial First State Investments Limited, Colonial Mutual Superannuation Limited and Avantios Investments Limited. I will outline the response for Colonial <coughs> First State only. Mr Peter Chun, General Manager Distribution, provided a statement on behalf of Colonial First State Investments Limited. Colonial is the trustee of four funds which offer 12 products of which two are my super products. Mr Chun gave evidence that none of the colonial funds require members to have a prescribed minimum balance. Accordingly, no members or beneficiaries of CFS's funds have been denied a TPD or death benefit claim for that reason. However, if a member's balance is too low to make payments for two months in a row, their policy will lapse. With regard to total and permanent disability, Mr Chun informed the Commission that during the relevant period, 85 members had their TPD claims rejected as they did not meet the definition of TPD applicable to their employment type at the time of disablement under the terms of the policy. There were no members who received reduced benefits under a TPD or life insurance policy because they did not have a prescribed employment status. A prescribed employment status did not result in any life insurance policy benefits being denied to members during the relevant period. And that in addition to the 85 members previously mentioned whose TPD claims were, were rejected, a further six claims were rejected because members did not satisfy an activities of daily living test or similar, similar requirement. In May 2018, a change was implemented to the effect that all members, regardless of employment type, are assessed against a full TPD definition rather than some being assessed against an activities of daily living TPD definition. 
With regard to income protection insurance, Mr Chun identified eight members whose income protection cover claims were declined owing to them not meeting the relevant policies prescribed employment status requirements. In regards to member communications, Mr Chun identified 33 incidents where communications with members did not reflect the terms of a group life policy. These included advising members of incorrect premium amounts, advising members that they were entitled to a higher level, level of cover than they were actually entitled to, paying incorrect benefits to members, and members receiving confirmation that they were covered despite not being eligible to receive cover. Of the 33 communicated incidents identified, uh, six of those incidents were identified uh, as occurring within 2018. Commissioner, I tender the statement of Peter Chun dated 31 August 2018 in response to rubric 635. Exhibit 6.212. I also tender the statement of Peter Chun dated 31 August 2018 in respect of Avantios Investments Limited in response to rubric 6.37. 6.213. And I tender the statement of Dr Lisa Marie butler Beatty, dated 31 August 2018, in respect of Colonial Mutual Superannuation Limited, in response to rubric 636. 6.214. Turning now to Newless Nominees Limited. Mr Thomas Gare, General Manager, Wealth Product and Platform Enablement, provided a statement on behalf of Newless. Newless does not hold group life insurance policies through its MLC superannuation fund and MLC super fund. So it does hold group life insurance policies through those two funds. In 2018, the MLC superannuation fund deducted amounts from 131 member accounts for income protection cover, 738 accounts for life insurance cover and 738 accounts for TPD insurance cover. This amounts to only 0.2% 1% and 1% of member accounts respectively. On the other hand, the MLC Super Fund deducted amounts from 159,177 member accounts for income protection cover, 632,800 member accounts for life insurance cover and 618,510 accounts for DP TPD insurance cover, being 18%, 70% and 69% respectively. Newless has informed the Commission that there is no prescribed minimum balance condition for its life insurance and TPD policies and that no members have been denied an insurance death or TPD claim owing to their account balance being below a prescribed minimum. Mr Gard identified one circumstance where a Nullis member was denied a benefit under a TPD insurance policy because a member did not meet a prescribed employment status requirement, although that was not the ultimate basis for denying the claim. And the basis for denying that specific claim was a failure to meet the activities of daily living test. As recently as 12 July 2018, consideration was ongoing as to whether or not the, activity dailies, the activities of daily living test should be replaced with an experience, training, education and rehabilitation test so as to reduce the number of declined claims of members engaged in casual employment. Mr Gard stated that in the relevant period, 24 members were denied a benefit under an income protection policy by reason that they did not meet the prescribed employment status requirements of that policy. Mr Gard also acknowledged that members are only eligible to make a claim on an income protection insurance policy if they are permanently employed at the time that they make the claim, although income protection premiums will continue to be deducted while a member is unemployed or employed in a capacity other than permanently, unless advised by the member. Newless identified four events where its communication with members did not accurately reflect the terms of the group life policy during the relevant period, and an additional event which involved miscommunication by a predecessor trustee. Newless also noted one event where it uh, was involved in remediation for miscommunication by MLC nominees. The Commission requested further information in connection with one of these reported breaches. Newlist reported a breach to ASIC on 23 May 2016 
It acknowledged that certain members in the MLC Master Key Business Superannuation Fund had their date of birth amended and were subsequently provided with inaccurate information regarding the level of insurance cover they had or the level of premiums that had been charged. Remediation activities were completed and ASIC was notified of the completion of those activities on the 17th of May 2017. Commissioner, I tender the statement of Thomas Lee Gard dated 31 August 2018 in response to rubric 638. Exhibit 6.215. Turning to One Path Custodians, Carolyn James, Head of Assurance and Compliance at the Trustee Benefit Review Team, Pensions and Investments for ANZ Wealth Australia, made a statement on behalf of One Path Custodians. Between 2014 and 2018, 5 per cent of members had income prote protection premiums deducted from their superannuation balances, 35.8 per cent of members for life insurance cover and 28.8 per cent for TPD insurance cover. For the Retirement Portfolio Service Fund, the highest percentage was for life insurance at only 1.4 per cent. OnePath did not have a prescribed minimum balance requirements. If premiums cannot be paid within a certain period, described as typically 60 days, the member's policy will lapse. Ms James gave evidence both that no claim for death or TPD benefits had been denied by reason of a member's account balance being below a prescribed minimum balance but that in some cases, where members had failed to pay their premiums and their insurance had, had lapsed, their later claims have been denied. During the relevant period, One Path Group life policies have contained reference to two elements of prescribed employment status, the type of employment and the minimum number of hours worked in a particular period. These elements are used to determine a member's entitlement to claim benefits under One Path's group life insurance policies. One Path disclosed that 30 members have been denied claims under one income protection insurance policy because of a prescribed employment status clause. Aside from the operation of this policy, One Path has not provided the Commission with information about other claims potentially denied due to prescribed employment status. In regards to member communications, One Path has disclosed 82 incidents where communications with members did not accurately reflect the terms of a group life policy. One Path limited its list of incidents to those with a $10,000 actual gain or loss that represent actual or potential compliance events with regulatory obligations. The miscommunications disclosed to the Commission include members being incorrectly informed that cover was active when it was not members being provided with inaccurate information about the relationship between age and premiums and incorrect verbal advice given by telephone. Commissioner, I tend to the statement of Carolyn Michelle James, dated 31 August 2018, provided in response to rubric 639. Exhibit 6.216. Turning now to the industry funds. Mr Paul Schroeder, Group Executive, Product Brand Reputation, provided a statement on behalf of Australian Super. <clears throat> the percentage of Australian Super Fund members that had accounts where insurance premiums were deducted between 2013 and 2018 was on average 37.6% for income protection cover, 61.6% for life insurance cover and 58.5% for TPD insurance. During the relevant period, 126 members were denied an insured death or TPD benefit by reason of the fact that the member's account balance was below a prescribed minimum balance. The account had not received an employer contribution for 13 months and the member was no longer paying insurance premiums. Australian Super stated that it has considered the operation of clauses of insurance policies which make prescribed minimum balances relevant to coverage or to the extent of the be a benefit payable as part of the overall insurance benefit design. Australian Super explained that these clauses have been inserted into its policies to prevent erosion of member account balances. <coughs> Mr Schroeder has not identified any members or beneficiaries who have been denied a benefit under a life insurance or TPD insurance policy or have received a reduced benefit by reason of the fact that the member did not have a prescribed employment status. 
However, members are not covered by Australian super's insurance policies if they meet certain definitions of pre-existing illness or injury. Mr Schroeder states that no member has been denied an income protection benefit or received a reduced benefit by reason of the fact that the member did not have a prescribed employment status. As to rebates and profit sharing, Australian Super disclosed that it has been party to arrangements with a number of insurers and two administrators in the relevant period. Mr Schroeder states that none of these arrangements involve profit sharing. In one case, Mr Schroeder identified that although an arrangement with Commonshaw was described as a profit sharing arrangement, payments received by Australian Super were paid into the administration reserve and used entirely for the benefit of insured members. Commissioner, I tender the statement of Paul Johan Schroeder, dated 30 August 2018, and provided in response to rubric 640. Exhibit 6.217. Mr Jason Sommer, S-O-M-M-E-R, provided two statements on behalf of Sun Super. During the relevant period, insurance was offered by Sun Super through its Sun Super Superannuation Fund. Sun Super informed the Commission that no Sun Super members have been denied an insured death or TPD benefit claim by reason of the fact that the member's account balance was below a prescribed minimum balance. Sun Super ceases deducting premiums and a member's cover ceases when a member's account falls below <coughs> $1,500 balance and employer contributions have not been received for 12 months. Members are notified on multiple occasions that their cover will cease if they fall into both of these categories. Mr Summer confirmed that a member can claim for death and TPD insurance benefits regardless of their balance if they have paid the relevant insurance premium. For example, a Sun Super member can receive insurance cover where their balance remains below $1,500 if they also receive employer superannuation contributions. Mr Sommer reported that there were no Sun Super members who had been denied a benefit under a death or TPD policy by reason of the fact that the member did not have a prescribed employment status. He stated that, it, that Sun Super had no prescribed minimum employment status requirements for the payment of death or TPD benefits. Sun Super identified 29 members who had been denied a benefit under an income protection insurance policy by reason that the person did not meet the prescribed employment status requirements of the policy. The prescribed employment status definition requires employees to be working at least 15 hours per week and be classified as permanent part-time or full-time when they commence their employment. Sunsuper also disclosed that it was party to two arrangements with third parties, Suncorp and AIA Insurance Limited. Sunsuper has submitted to the Commission that they have not received rebates in its personal capacity under the arrangements. It is entitled to a rebate under the profit share arrangements and those rebates have been used to subsidise members' insurance premiums, invest in improving its claims management processes and to cover administrative costs. In respect of member communications, Sun Super disclosed 12 instances where it had communicated with members in a way that did not accurately reflect the terms of the group life policy. These instances include issuing an insurance guide which contained incorrect insurance premiums and issuing a corporate plan guide that contained an incorrect definition of permanent employment. Commissioner, I tender two statements of Jason Brett Sommer. The first dated 12 September in answer to rubric 573. Exhibit 6.218. The second dated 31 August in answer to rubric 642. Exhibit 6.219. Mr Noel Lacey, the Head of Insurance Compli Complaints and Compliance, provided two statements on behalf of United Super Proprietary Limited, more commonly referred to as CBUS. No members of United Super have been denied an insurance death or TPD benefit claim by reason of the fact that the member's account balance was below a prescribed minimum balance. Where there have been no employer contributions to a member account for six months and a member's account balance falls below $1,200, 
premiums will stop being deducted and the insurance coverage will cease. Mr Lacey states that CBUS does not include a prescribed employment status requirement in its life and TPD insurance policies and as such no members have been denied a benefit for that reason. During the rel relevant period, Mr Lacey identified denials of benefits under income protection insurance policies by reason of the operation of a prescribed employment status requirement. United Super also disclosed that it was party to two agreements with third parties pursuant to which it receives rebates in respect of coverage offered under group life policies. Those arrangements were as follows. During the relevant period, United Super had two profit sharing arrangements that applied within the funds policies, one with Hanover Life and the other with TAL. These arrangements were described by United Super as reconciliation arrangements, meaning that if the premiums paid by the fund over a given period were too high, the fund would be reimbursed the difference between the premiums paid and what should in fact have been paid Conversely, if the premiums paid by the insurer are too low over the given period, the fund is obliged to pay the insurer the difference. <coughs> CBUS made one disclosure of a major incident during the relevant period where communications with members did not accurately reflect the terms of the group policy. Its external administrator, Super Partners, informed the fund of errors in the administration of member accounts between 2010 and 2013. These errors included incorrect administration of premium deductions, incorrect calculation of members' level of cover, and incorrect commencement and cessation dates for insurance cover. As a result of these errors, members' annual statements may have contained incorrect information regarding pre premium deductions and insurance cover over a number of reporting periods. APRA and ASIC were informed of the issue, CBUS engaged in a remediation program and implemented measures to ensure members had not been disadvantaged by the error. ASIC finished its investigation into the matter and notified United Super in February 2017 that no enforcement action would be taken. Commissioner, I tender two statements of Noel Lacey. The first in answer to rubric 574 and dated 12 September 2018. Exhibit 6.220. The second, in answer to rubric 643, and dated 31 September. 6.221. Finally, Commissioner Host Plus. Mr Colin Cassidy, National Insurance Manager, provided a statement on behalf of Host Plus. During the relevant period, Host Plus provided default death insurance and combined death and TPD insurance to members. The amount of coverage offered was determined by the kind of employment the member engaged in and was stepped by member age. Host Plus also offered members voluntary income protection cover, with members able to select the amount of coverage. On average, group life insurance premiums were deducted from 994,380 member accounts in each year from the 30th of June 2013 to the 30th of June 2017. By way of example, on 30 June 2018, 82.6% of member accounts had amounts deducted for death insurance, 81.2% for TPD insurance and 3.1% for income protection insurance. Host Plus does not have prescribed minimum balances or prescribed employment status clauses in its group life policies. Host Plus stated that it has not considered introducing clauses imposing prescribed minimum balance or prescribed employment status. Mr Cassidy disclosed that during the relevant period Host Plus was party to arrangements with two insurers, One Path Life Limited and MetLife, and two external administrators. None of those arrangements involved profit sharing. Host Plus identified an issue in respect of member communications in its 29 January 2018 submission to the Commission, which involved an error in the calculation of insurance premiums in 2013, Mr Cassidy gave ev evidence by way of his statement that Host Plus considers that to be the sole instance in the relevant period where it has communicated with its members in a way that did not accurately reflect the terms of a group life policy. 
Commissioner, I tender the statement of Colin Cassidy, dated 31 August 2018, provided in response to rubric 644. Exhibit 6.222. Commissioner, that brings us to the next case study, which involves rest. The witness is Lachlan Ross. Yes, Mr. Ross, do you mind coming into the witness box? If you wouldn't mind remaining standing a moment. Um, can I ask you first whether you'd prefer to make an oath or take an affirmation? An oath, please. Swear the witness, please. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give that the evidence I shall give will be the truth. Will be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Do sit down, Mr. Ross. Yes, Mr. Stolter. Uh, now, your full name is Lachlan Gambier Ross. Yes. And your business address is Level Five Three Two One Kent Street, Sydney. Yes. Uh, and you're attending uh, today to give evidence pursuant to a summons served upon you by the Commission? That's right. Do you have a copy of that there with you, the summons? I do. Um, I tender the summons to Mr Ross. So at 6.223, the summons to Mr Ross. Uh, now, Mr Ross, um, you. you, you've prepared um, two witness statements, and I'll, I'll deal with them in order. Uh, the first is in respect of rubric 641, and in particular Part F of that rubric. Um, you prepared a witness statement um, in that regard on 31 August 2018? I did. Uh, and that has, uh, I note for the record, number WIT 00101440001. Uh, now, is the content of that statement true and correct to the best of your knowledge and belief? It is. I tender uh, Mr Ross's statement in respect of rubric 641 of 31 August 2018. Yep statement and its exhibits becomes exhibit <coughs> 6.224. Uh, now your second statement, Mr Ross, um, is in respect of rubric 665 and in particular questions 1 to 10 inclusive and 15 of that rubric uh, and that's dated 7 September 2018. That's correct. Uh, and I note for the record that that has um, ID number WIT 001 zero one five four zero zero one uh, now is the content of that statement true and correct to the best of your knowledge and belief it is i tender mr ross's statement in respect of rubric 665 dated 7 september 2018. that statement becomes exhibit 6.225 uh, now mr ross um council assisting has some questions for you thank you yes mr costello Mr Ross, approximately how many members does REST have? Around 2 million. And how many of those members have life insurance through REST? Between 1.4 and 1.5 million. You're the Service Delivery Manager Insurance? That's correct. And you say in your statement that your, or your statements that your role includes review of every claim declined by an insurer? Um, the team that I manage review the declined claims, yes. And when you say by an insurer, do you mean AIA? I do. Are there other insurers? Um, there are. And who are they? Um, Hanover. Um, and also we have had insurers prior to AA. And we do, from time to time, still have claims made on those policies, which we would review any declines of them as well. Is AIA the current group life insurer for REST? Yes. And for how long has AIA been the group life insurer? Um, I believe they were appointed in um, 2004. And approximately how many claims are made against the REST group life policies each year? Um, I expect it would be in the vicinity of um, 6,000 this year. 6,000 this year? Yes. And how many of those do you expect would be declined? Um, in total, um, REST pays around um, over nine out of 10 claims. So um, this year, I would expect we would decline in the vicinity of um, 400. Um, that's not quite 10% because there's a delay um, in receiving claims as well. I see. Um, and what's the annual premium bill 
that REST pays to AIA in um, general terms? It, uh, 750 to 800 million this year. And is that variable on anything other than the number of members in the fund? Um, REST has had 2 million members for quite some time. Um, the driver is the level of premium more than the number of members, I would say. And how often are premiums reviewed under the group life policy? Um, it varies, but between two to three years, there is a pricing review. That's a, that's a right of the insurer to have a pricing review every two to three years under the policy? I'm not sure if it's a right of the insurer. Um, that's not my specific error policy, but... A, a but in practice, that's what you understand to have happened? Yes. Thank you. Does REST understand part of its role as being to assist members with their life insurance? Um, what do you mean by assist members with their life insurance? Provide them with information about cover? Um, yes. And assist in the making of a claim against the policy? Yes. Has REST agreed to comply with the insurance in super voluntary code of practice? I believe we have expressed our intent to comply with that, yes. And do you know when you intend to comply with it? Um, I believe by um, the end of 2019. Is that a document you've had any involvement with? No. Are you familiar with its terms? Um, broadly. I imagine that parts of it will affect your role. Correct. There is a section on claims handling. And are you aware of any internal debate within REST about whether the voluntary code should be adhered to? Um, no, I'm not. All right. Um, can I just take you to the voluntary code? Um, it's RCD 0025 0005 0606. <coughs> This is the code, Mr Ross. You can see at the top there are three bodies noted, AIST, ASFA and FSC. Yes. Is REST a member of any of those bodies? I believe we are a member of AIST and ASFA, yes. The first um, two? Yes, we, I'm not sure if we're a member of the FSC. Thank you. Um, <coughs> if I could take you to... 0615 of that document. <coughs> Mr Ross, you might not be in a position to answer all of these questions, but I just want to put them to you to understand the extent to which the code differ, differs from REST's current practice. Um, you can see there clause 5.17, which is headed communications during the term of your cover. And it says that we will provide you with an annual statement which includes the following information. And that information includes the types of cover you hold and how much you're insured for, your current premium, an explanation for any changes in your premiums, the policy standard exclusions, and the benefit limitation terms that may impact your entitlement to insurance benefits. If we've not received any eligible contributions in the previous year, or if your eligible contributions are less than $1,800 for a previous year, a warning that your premiums may be inappropriately eroding your account balance. Now, just pausing there for a moment, are you familiar with REST's annual statements to its members? Um, broadly, yes. Are you a member of the REST fund yourself? I am. And you receive an annual statement? I do. All right. From your own experience, and perhaps that at work, are you aware which of those from A to E REST is currently complying with? Um, I believe we comply with A to D. Um, I'm not sure if we have the specific wording included in E. All right. And then um, what about F to J, information about how to 
contact us to discuss options if you want to change the terms, how you can increase, decrease or cancel your cover, information about the code you obviously don't comply with now, our rules for automatic cessation of cover and what to do in the event of a claim. Do you comply with those? I would believe we do. Do you think you comply with I, our rules for automatic cessation of cover? I believe we have disclosure um, around what is required for rest to know in order for cover to be in place. What are the rules for automatic cessation of cover that currently exist within REST's policy? Perhaps I'll put it a little bit more specifically mm. to help you. Um, if you were in the hearing room when I just delivered that rather long address, you would have heard me speak of two types of clauses, and these are two clauses that you deal with in one of your witness statements. The yes. first was a prescribed minimum balance clause. Yes. Um, does REST currently have a prescribed minimum balance clause? Um, there is no prescribed minimum balance clause in our policy, no. There has been historically, though. Um, historically, there has been um, part of the policy which is dependent on um, having a minimum balance, but that works in tandem with another part of the policy as well. And what's that other part? Um, that the member needs to be um, still employed by an employer who is making um, contributions to rest on their behalf. All right, we'll come back to that. Um, if I could then take you perhaps to the part of the code that will be more readily um, applicable to you at 0617 of that document. This is clause 7, handling claims. And perhaps if we could bring up uh, 0618 as well on the screen. Have you looked at this before? Um, it's been some time, but I have seen it before, yes. All right. Um, Perhaps before we get to the detail of the clause, could you explain to me what the role of the superannuation trustee is in connection with claims under group life policies? Um, yes, the, as you um, spoke to earlier, the trustee is the policy holder. Um, I think of particular importance, um, if a claim is declined, um, the trustee will review the decline um, to make an assessment about whether it is um, fair and reasonable. Um, the trustee also has a role in um, the payment of benefits um, because most benefits are released into the member's superannuation account um, and then the trustee must make a determination about um, whether that meets a condition of release and can be released to a member. All right. So for, say, an injured member who wants to claim, say a seriously injured member who wants to make a claim on a um, total and permanent disability policy... Yes. Um, ..is the role of REST to assist... The, is it any role of REST to assist the member in making that claim? Um, in my experience, REST certainly... Um, takes its role very seriously um, to make members aware they have an insured benefit and it is very interested that they receive any benefit they're entitled to, yes. I just want to understand um, the role a little bit because in a normal policy, say a TPD policy, mm. um, that is outside of superannuation, the policy holder is the individual and the policyholder makes a claim, and to the extent there is a dispute, it is a dispute as between the policyholder and the insurance company. Yes. Group life is substantially different from that because of the interposition of the superannuation trustee, somewhere in the middle between the policy, sorry, between the superannuation fund member and the 
insurance company. Yes. And what I'm trying to understand is what REST conceives its role as being. Are you an intermediary between the two? Are you there to fight for the member? Or are you there to defend the insurance policy on behalf of the insurer? Um, you know, REST's view is that insurance is very valuable to its membership. Um, and ultimately it's REST that has made the decision to provide this benefit to its members. Um, and it works very hard to make sure that any benefits um, that a member is entitled to um, are paid to the member. And how does it do that? Um, it <coughs> works with the insurer and um, in REST case we have an administrator, an external administrator, um, to design the claims process and um, monitor claims, um, make sure that any benefits members are entitled to are paid. All right. Um, well, understanding that, let me now try and relate it to the terms of the code. You'll see there at um, 7.3, it says we, that's for relevant purposes, REST, will oversee the claims process and help you navigate the process. Is that something you would describe REST as doing now? Yes. And 7.4, we will be responsible for overseeing the conduct of the insurer and any service provider we engage in the claims process in line with the standards in section 12 of the code. Are you aware of the standards in section 12? Uh, no. Okay. Well. I'll ask you the question without reference to Section 12 for now. Do you see REST's role as overseeing the conduct of the insurer and any service provider that you engage? I think that's a fair statement, yes. All right. And while we're in 7.4, there's talk of service providers, and you've already mentioned, I think, a service provider. What service provider did you have in mind when you spoke of one a few moments ago? Uh, uh, <coughs> Sorry, our external administrator is um, double AS. Did you say double AS? Yes, that's part of Link Group. And what's their role? Their role as it pertains to what, sorry, Mr Casilla. What, what is the role that you have engaged? You've contracted with double AS? You, sorry, you being REST, have contracted with double AS? And what have you asked them to do? Do you mean specifically around claims? Yes. Yes. Um, when a member wants to make a claim, um, they call REST um, and the person they'll be speaking to works at Administrator Double S. Um, they'll then be provided claims forms, um, documents to help them navigate the claims process. That'll be done by Double S as well. Um, the initial information will be gathered by our administrator. Um, it'll then be passed to our insurer. Um, they're also involved with the um, payment of insured benefits as well, TPD and death benefits. Um, as the insurer, um, when there is a benefit, passes it back to um, our administrator, Double S, who then put it into the member's account. And is this a... Does Double S do functions separate from insurance? Uh, yes, they rest? do. Right. So... Um, Correct me if I'm wrong, it sounds to me like the role of AAS is in some respects an outsourcing by rest of at least parts of the insurance claims handling process and in the insurance administration. Yes. Um, and other parts of the process are done internally by you and your staff. Yes. All right. Um, just while we're in clause seven there, if that box could come down, please, and I could direct your attention to 7.12. And you may or may not have noticed that there is a screen next to you there, if it's easier for you to look at, but it's a matter for you. Um, 7.12 is on 6, 0618. Can you see it there? It's the first under making the first paragraph under the heading making a claim on the second page. Yes. If you tell us that you wish to make a claim, we will help you provide the information for your claim or direct you to the appropriate forms or information online or email these to you. Do you do that now? Oh, we do. And then it says if we receive a completed claim form from you within five business days, we'll acknowledge receipt 
assess whether you've provided all information, provide you with a summary of the claims process and either provide the claim to the insurer or tell you that you are not eligible to make a claim. Do you do that now? Um, we do. I, I don't have information about whether we do that in five business days or not. Do you benchmark it <clears throat> internally, how long it takes you to process a claim once it's received by REST? We do monitor it, yes. Do you have an idea of what it might be? Not off the top of my head, no. Is that the sort of metric that your team's performance might be assessed by? It's an important metric for us, but it's not a KPI if that's what you're driving at. Do you have any understanding of what it might be? How many days it might be? Um, we're doing a lot of work on our claims process at the moment. Um, we would have some claims um, where it's happening on the same day. Um, we would have other claims um, where it takes longer. Um, I don't have an average that I can give you that. All right. Um, there's just one f more clause that I want to take you to in this <coughs> um, code. It's on page 0613. Can you see the uh, 4.31 duplicate insurance cover? Yes. And it says, when you become a member of our fund, we will ask your permission to help you to determine whether you have any other insurance cover in a superannuation fund. The purpose of this is to ensure you do not unintentionally pay premiums for multiple insurance covers or for any cover on which you may be unable to claim. If we identify that you have other insurance cover, we will let you know. Do you know how many REST members have duplicate funds? No, I do not. Do you know if that's something that REST monitors at the moment? I'm sure we do as much as that information is available to us. Um, again, this might not be something that you can speak to, but are you aware that under the Superannuation Industry Supervision Act there is an obligation in some circumstances for trustees to consolidate duplicate accounts? Is that something you've, you're aware of? Um, no, not specifically. All right. Um, what you may be more aware of, though, is that in the current group life policy by REST, there is an exclusion clause based on multiple policies. Are you familiar with that clause? Um, I can take you to it. If that'd be helpful. Of course. It's Exhibit LGR3 to your... Uh, witness statement 641, which is uh, RST.0006.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0
um, we hold multiple accounts yes. on behalf of a member? Yes. Um, that's as I understood okay. it. Okay. Um, are you aware that these types of clauses have received some public attention recently? Um, no. All right. Um, are you aware of whether this clause has been enforced by AIA in recent times? Um, no, I'm not. Do you think that the presence of this clause makes it all the more important that REST identify if there are members with duplicate accounts with REST? Oh, I, I totally agree, and we do. And how do you do that? Um, I mean, REST is a, is a very large fund, yes. um, and from time to time um, we will have accounts set up, and when accounts are set up, um, we sometimes receive very limited information um, from an employer. Mm. Um, so we could um, receive an account which has a um, different surname and different date of birth, but unbeknownst to us, um, it is a duplicate account. Yes. Um, so if we can identify duplicate accounts, um, we merge them and refund insurance premiums immediately. And are you aware of whether or not this duplicate account clause has existed in policies issued to rest by AIA before 2017? Um, I'm not aware, no. All right. Um, but you would agree, wouldn't you, that having members paying insurance premiums for in circumstances where they, want, they would not be entitled to the cover is something that REST is obliged to avoid? I would agree, yes. Yes, thank you. All right. Um, I want to... That document can come off the screen. Thank you. Commissioner, I should just tender the voluntary code. Insurance and superannuation <coughs> voluntary code of practice RCD 0025 0005 0606 exhibit 6.226. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Mr. Ross, we've already mentioned prescribed minimum balance clauses. Yes. Um, and you said that REST no longer has a prescribed minimum balance clause, I think. Was that your evidence? My evidence was there is no prescribed um, minimum balance clause currently. And there has been in the past? Um, working in combination with another, I think in fairness to you, you said working in combination with another requirement or another definition. Correct. There were yes. two parts of the policy that worked in tandem. One of them related to account balance, yes. Yes. All right. Perhaps the easiest way to do it is if, if I take you to the paragraph of your witness statement in um, answer to rubric 641 where you deal with the history of <coughs> prescribed minimum balance clauses in the AIA group life policies. Zero zero one one to start. Yeah. Just, sorry, Commissioner. The um, document ID for the six forty one witness statement is I hope WIT dot double zero double one dot zero one double four dot triple zero one. Three numbers given. Oh, sorry, it's double zero one dot zero one double four dot triple zero one. And if we could go to the second page, perhaps have the second and third pages on the screen. You'll recall, Mr Ross, that in paragraph six here, you gave some explanation of the history of prescribed minimum balance clauses in the AIA policies. Yes. Remember that? Um, and you started... Um, answering it by reference to the period that we'd put to you, which was 1 July 2013 to 31 
December, sorry, 1 July 2013 to date was the period that we asked you for. Yes. And you explained that um, from 1 July 2013, the relevant policy um, was a 2008 policy that had been, I think I'm right in saying, retrospectively varied by an agreement in March 2011. Is that what you remember saying? You feel free to have a look at 6A of your statement. So did you say retrospectively varied in your question to me? I did. Um, I don't think it's been varied. Um, I think that's when the um, agreement came into effect, but it had been in force until that, that point. Right. I, I'm not sure that I understand that, but it, it might not be important. I was just taking your words by agreement dated 4 March 2011 and with retrospective effect from 5 December 2008. Yes. Was there, did the 4 March 2011 agreement vary an early agreement or did it just have force as of an earlier date? Oh, we, I'm getting into muddy sort of legal waters here, Mr Costello. Um, I think what happened was the policy um, was in force. I think the final sig legal signatures may have happened right. in 2011, but this is okay. well before my time. All right, no, that's fine. Um, the more important part is the second part of 6A where you say the rest super 2008 death and TPD policy provided continued cover for death for members who ceased employment with a contributing employer subject to a prescribed minimum balance of $1,200. Yes. So in more simple terms, under this policy, a member with a balance of $1,000 did not have coverage for death? No. As so, as you know, that's not correct. Sorry? Um, what happened, um, all rest members um, who have insurance cover, um, is th what begins insurance cover is a contribution from an employer. Yes. Um, at that point, they continue to have cover, um, however, if they stop working for the employer who has paid the contribu paying contributions to rest, they continue to have cover for um, 71 days. Yes. And in order to keep it after that point, um, they would have needed to have an account balance of more than $1,200. Yes. So if they, I think perhaps what I had failed to put in my question to you was um, an unemployed member who had been unemployed for more than 71 days and had a balance of less than $1,200 would not have cover. Is that right? More or less, yes. I'm just a, not, not necessarily unemployed, um, not receiving... Um, it wouldn't be limited to people who were unemployed. Um, it's specific to an employer who is making contributions to rest. Yes. Does that mean then that... Um, a person who was employed but whose employer was not making compulsory contributions could be caught by this clause? They would not be covered by the clause, yes. Yes. Um, well, when you say they wouldn't be covered by the clause, would they, be co would they have insurance coverage? Well, it would depend. Um, employer is a defined term in our policy. Um, so where employer is referenced in our policy, um, it is referenced as an employer who is making compulsory superannuation contributions to rest on behalf of that member. All right. And you go on to say there, in addition, the 2008 policy introduced continued cover for TPD with a prescribed minimum balance requirement of $3,000. Correct. Could you explain continued cover? Um, so that was what I was referring to before. Um, when members join and get a compulsory contribution, their insurance cover starts. So the principle at rest is cover for as many people as possible. Um, and they will have that cover until um, they are no longer employed by that employer making contributions to rest. Um, but they will continue to have that cover um, for 71 days um, 
I believe the principal being, you know, time to find a new job. Um, and then they will continue to have cover after that, but as long as they have an account balance over either the $1,200 for that particular period there or the $3,000 for the period um, I'm referring to there too. I see. And then there was a change made to that clause that you set out in B, which we can probably skip over because there was a further change made and from um, the 1st of December 2017, which is the policy that I have already taken you to yes. once, the position is what in respect of prescribed minimum balances? Well, this clause is not in the current policy. Right. And why was that change made? Um, from what I've reviewed, um, the change was made um, to align with um, principles of clarity and simplicity. Um, from 1 July 2013 to 30 June 2018, you say 11 death benefit claims were declined because of the application of the clauses we've been talking about. Yes. And 36 TPD uh, claims were denied. Yes. And do you agree that it's important that members have an awareness of their level of cover? I think it is important, yes. And it's important that REST communicates accurately with members about their level of cover? Yes, it is. And these types of clauses make it difficult to communicate with members about their level of cover in some respects because they are necessarily complicated in their factual application. Do you agree with that? Um, I would agree that these types of clauses um, do make it more complicated and hence why um, in 2017 we removed it. Um, but there is a balance to be struck as well. Um, between? Um, between um, members with low balances um, who may not be working, being charged insurance premiums, um, and also having simple um, clear cover. So what REST had for that five year period and has now removed, um, those high level principles are what has been proposed by the government to come back into force. Essentially this idea of a um, account balance under which premiums don't get charged and a period of time after unemployment um, in which premiums don't get charged either. So I think it's a difficult question um, yes. and a balance needs to be struck. And it's a contested question in some respects of public policy. Yes. And uh, what needs to be weighed is, on the one hand, the benefit to a member of having continued insurance cover. Yes. Versus what's sometimes described as erosion of balance. Yes, I think it's a difficult question. Yes. And you're correct, a contested one at the moment. And, and does REST have a view about that? about that, that question, whether insurance coverage should continue for as long as it can, or whether it is better for it to stop in order to cease the erosion of a low balance account? Well, I think it's, you can see from our policies that it has been a question that has been weighed and considered mm. um, over the period. I can't speak um, for what you know the position might be um, in regards to the public policy debate at the moment. Are you aware of REST making any contribution to that debate? Um, I believe we may have, yes. And how was that done? Um, I believe we may have appeared um, at a Senate committee. Well, um, we may or may not have you made... You don't need to tell me anything more about that. Thank okay. you. Um, that, that's not a... Parliamentary credit. Privileges Act. That's not a Cuts criticism of you. Point. It's just a, a risk, and I could see the commissioner glaring at me. <laughs> um, Better you than me, Mr. Costello. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you agree oh, that the? Just a <laughs> <laughs> um, do you agree that one of the most important documents for communicating levels of insurance cover to members is annual statements? It, it's one of the important ones. Yes. The type of communication a member might be more inclined to have regard to. I mean, it's certainly an important communication for a superannuation fund, yes. Do you think it's more likely that a member would read an annual statement that tells them what their superannuation balance is than, say, 
a letter setting out changes to a complicated policy of insurance? Um, I'm, I'm not sure I can answer that question. Um, when you say a complicated a letter outlining complicated changes to insurance, um, I think members are interested in their annual statements, yes. Yes, thank you. Um, are you aware of whether in the period that REST had prescribed minimum balance requirements in its group life policies, it had systems that set the amount of coverage of members caught by that clause at zero in their annual statement? Sorry, I don't, I don't understand the question. Um, well, imagine a person who, by operation of one of the clauses that you have explained in paragraph 6A and 6B of your statement, a person comes within the exclusion and does not have coverage. On that person's annual statement, would the statement display their coverage as zero or would it display their coverage as another amount? Well, as long as REST is aware, or had been aware, um, of their employment status, it would display a zero, yes. It would. Yes. REST had those policies in place. Yes. And how does REST become aware of the person's employment status? Um, we would rely upon the employer um, or also we would rely upon the member to let us know. That is, if the, uh, if the member has ceased work with an employer, either the employer or the member tell REST? Yes. And if that has happened, REST is then able to look at what the person's balance is and if the balance is below the prescribed minimum in the annual statement, REST would set the person's coverage at zero. Correct. And you've seen that happen in statements? Yes. And in your experience, how promptly are notifications made to REST by employers? Oh, it's not something that I'm close to. Are you aware of the extent to which these clauses operated to deny coverage in circumstances where REST's information was wrong because it hadn't been notified by an employer or an employee? So there have been cases where a claim has been declined um, where REST has subsequently found out that a member was not employed. Is that a common occurrence? Um, I wouldn't say it's common and hence the quite low numbers of declines right. um, in my witness statement. Um, in your statement um, at paragraph 14, you set out the various ways that members were advised of prescribed minimum balances. Perhaps we could go, thank you. And you inform members of the terms of their insurance cover and the circumstances in which the cover would cease and provided members with information to make them aware of the importance of notifying rest of changes to their employment status. How, is, how are changes of employment status notified to rest? Is there a form that needs to be used? Um, generally that would come um, from the employer um, when they make their um, contributions to rest on behalf of their employees. When they make their contribution, when they make the final contribution, do you mean? Yeah, so rest has um, some very large employers um, who contribute um, and they would pay generally pay um, monthly and we would typically receive a file that would have um, new members, um, existing members and um, exited members, or members that were no longer employed by them. And in your witness statement, you use a few times the term arrest employer. Yes. What's arrest employer? Um, well, I think that gets back to what I was talking about with the policy. Um, in terms of claims, um, employer is a defined term in our policy, and um, without referencing my witness statement, um, I believe what I'm referring to is um, employers who are contributing to REST. That's any employer who's paying contributions to a REST member's fund uh, account? Yes. Thank you. 
Now, if a REST member was caught by a prescribed minimum balance clause and no longer had coverage, when did REST stop charging premiums? Um, just to, when you say caught, um, it was quite intentional um, to stop charging premiums to protect the balance from um, um, going down. Um, so I wouldn't use the word caught. Um, well, I, I don't mean it pejoratively. I just yeah. mean the clause has effect and you say it's an effect that was intended. And my question yes. is when did you stop charging premiums when the clause had that effect? Um, as soon as we became aware. And in some cases you would never have but you never became aware except by reason of the fact that a claim was made? Yes. And in those circumstances, the premiums w were funded when? As soon as we became aware. So um, when we became aware, um, a date would have been entered into our administration system and that would have automatically triggered um, the refund of premiums. All right. Um, I just want to take you quickly to an example of one of these clauses in operation. I think it's an example of one of these clauses in operation. Can I take you please to um, RST.0011.0001 Now this is a um, type of letter that I imagine you're very familiar with? Um, yes. Uh, is this what is referred to sometimes as a procedural fairness letter? Yes, that's correct. All right. And so this is a letter that AIA issues um, to a REST member who's made a claim when they formed a preliminary view of how they intend to deal with the claim. Is that right? Yes. And are these typically copied to REST as well? Um, no, we're not copied in on these. Right. Um, so you don't have any involvement in the process, at, at least at this point in the claims process, REST isn't involved? No. This is just between the REST member and the super fund? Uh, uh, sorry, and the insurer? Yes. All right. So this is a um, TPD claim. And you can see there that the insurers reached the preliminary view that the claim should be declined. Yes. On the basis that your insurance cover had already ceased. Can you see there that the date of injury that caused the injury, sorry, the date of the injury that caused the total and permanent disablement was the 1st of August 2016. See in the box there under the heading claim? Yes. And then if we go over the page to 0138, the insurer sets out its reasons for the prelimin preliminary view that it's formed. I'll just give you a moment to read that. Right. So I think that in general terms, without going to all of the detail, what happened here was coverage commenced on the 9th of March 2015 and the member ceased work with his then employer on the 17th of May 2016. Yes. And as you explained before, coverage then continued for 71 days from that date. Yes. Um, which meant that it stopped on the 27th of July 2016. Yes. And then the member became totally and permanently incapacitated on the 1st of August <coughs> 2016. Yes. And at the time, this member had a, a, a balance that was below the prescribed minimum threshold. Yes. And so 
the reason for the insurer declining this claim has nothing to do with the extent of the member's injury. It's the operation of the clauses that you and I have been discussing already. Um, yes. And the way those clauses operated in this case was the person was about five days outside of cover. Yes. When they suffered their injury. And the letter goes on to say that REST did not become aware of the fact that the member had ceased work until the 28th of August 2017. Yes. So this is one of those cases where the, neither the employer nor, nor the employee has promptly notified REST of the change in employment status. Yes. Why would it occur to an employee to notify REST that they stopped working at their current job? Um, it could be because they have um, read the disclosure material that was provided them when they joined REST, um, or they've read their annual statement. Um, Does the annual statement tell them to do that? It talks to the importance of notifying REST if they're no longer employed, yes. The first option that you just gave is not a realistic one, is it? What do you mean it's not a realistic one? That the person would notify you because they've read... What was the document you said? Well, it was... Um, in this period, it would have been the insurance guide, I imagine. Mm. Is that something that many of REST's 2 million members do in your experience? I don't know um, what they read that we send them, Mr Costello. Are you aware of how effective your communications with your own members about key insurance terms are? Oh, we hope they are very effective. Well, do, my question wasn't one directed to hope. It was, do you do any work within REST to ascertain whether or not members understand important insurance terms? Um, well, we try and be as clear as possible um, in all our communications um, to our members and we highlight areas we think are of particular importance when we communicate with them. I, the, I can show you a document if I need to, but you, you can take it from me that the preliminary view the insurer had here, had expressed here, became the final view? Yes. And this claim was yes. declined? Um, is this the sort of declined claim that REST took into account when negotiating for the new terms that do not include a prescribed minimum balance clause? So I don't really understand the question um, took into account when we negotiated our new policy. Yes. When you negotiated the new policy, the 2017 policy yes. that we've been to, the prescribed minimum balance clauses that were in the older policies were removed. Yes. Um, and they were removed, I think you said, for clarity. Yes. Um, and for ease of understanding of members, perhaps? Yes. Um, were they also removed because a case like this where somebody misses out on a claim, not for any reason to do with the injury the person has suffered, but because they are five days outside of a clause in an insurance policy, was that something that REST took into account in doing away with prescribed minimum balance clauses? Um, I, I wasn't involved um, in the writing of our new policy, um, but in answer to your question, I would say that I, I doubt the issue of um, five days or not had any effect um, on the considerations. Well, in this case, REST was unaware that the person's employment had ceased. Yes. And one consequence of that would be that the person continued to pay premiums. Yes. And at the time this person was injured, they were paying premiums for a policy of TPD insurance. Yes. And notwithstanding the fact that they were paying for paying premiums for that policy, because of the operation of a rather technical rule, they fell out of the terms of the policy for five days and instead of being entitled to insurance coverage, were entitled to a partial refund of their premiums. Is that the sort of circumstance that would concern REST? Um, well, I think when the 
policy was changed, one of the reasons was um, because of complaints we'd received um, from members. Complaints received from members? Yes. About this type of operation of the clause? Yes. According to the procedures that then obtained, would this declining of cover have been reviewed by REST? Absolutely. In the course of that review, one can only wonder whether attention was given to the notion that PTSD uh, has a specific start date uh, of 1 August, which is uh, the date on which the uh, doctor issued a certificate. But uh, I just wonder what that may say, if anything, uh, about the nature of the review that's undertaken. Um, what I would say is when they, without having um, the claim file, um, they would have looked for the earliest date possible under the policy. Um, and the premise yeah. for my question is, is one that you rightly test. The premise for my question, unstated, um, which needs to be brought to the surface, mm -hmm. is uh, a challenge to the notion that PTSD, uh, in effect, starts on a day. It's a at least not something that intuitively seems uh, uh, immediately apparent. I'd agree with that. Well, Mr Ross, just let me ask you one more question in that connection. Once the insurer has made their decision, REST is not informed of this procedural fairness letter. So this is a preliminary, this is That's right. pre to this, the actual the, decision. Pre to the decision. You're not involved yes. at this point. No. A decision is then made, it confirms the preliminary view and that notification is typically made to REST, not directly to the member? Um, so in this case, the um, notification, yeah, sorry, the notification is always made to REST. As the policy owner? Yes. And REST communicates that to its member? Um, not until it has conducted, well, um, sorry, yes, it does communicate that to the member, yes. Immediately? Um, I'm not sure in what time period, but I would more or less, yes. And this is when your team becomes involved, because this is a declined claim and your team is responsible for the review of every declined claim? Yes. So what then happens within REST? You receive the letter from AIA that de declines the claim on the basis set out in the letter, which we can assume is the same basis set out here. What do your team then do? Um, so it actually doesn't start at our team, my team. Um, it actually goes to um, REST administrator who conduct a first review. Um, it is then forwarded to the trustee um, and the team will receive a copy of the decline letter um, plus a copy of the claim file um, and they will conduct a thorough review of the claim to see if that decline they believe is fair and reasonable. Is fair and reasonable? Yes. And do you know why fair and reasonable is the test? Um, no, not off the top of my head. It, it, it might be that yeah. that's the basis that the Superannuation Complaints Tribunal will yes. review decisions. Um, so your team will then assess it to determine if it's fair and reasonable. And in a case like this where it's the operation of a clause in a policy, what does that mean? Does that just mean checking the accuracy of the material in the decline letter and the insurer's view as to the operation of the clause? Um, yeah, they want to check to see that the policy has been correctly applied. Right. Um, can I just take you to another document, please? Um, it's rcd.0025.0003. Dot zero double three four. Mr. Ross, this is ASIC Report five two nine, Member Experience of Superannuation from June last year. Have you seen this report before? Uh, not that I can remember. All right. Um, if we could go, please, to page zero three four nine. which is on page 16 of that document. Can you see there, there's the heading changes to or cessation of cover? 
This is directed yes. specifically this part to um, insurance within superannuation and you can see that from the opening words of paragraph 60. One of the specific features of insurance in superannuation is that it's not guaranteed renewable. See that? Yes, I do. If you could then focus on paragraph 61. It says, within insurance and superannuation, changes may be made to the policy or cover may cease without the member's active consent and in some cases with no timely disclosure about the change at all. See that? I can, yes. Do you think that the one circumstance that would fit within ASIC's description there is the operation of the type of clause that we've been talking about in a case like the one I just took you to? Um, well, I certainly think the in the case we've been talking about, um, cover may cease without the member's um, active consent. Um, well, it, it absolutely does, doesn't yes. it? Yes. Um, in the other clause, there with no timely disclosure about the change at all, um, as soon as REST becomes aware, um, it will communicate with the member that their cover has ceased. But part of this is a process issue, isn't it? True it is that when REST becomes aware, you'll let them know. But that just begs the question of how REST becomes aware. And in this case, which is not an isolated instance, I'm sure you'll agree, REST wasn't aware. No, we were not. And the reason REST wasn't aware was because it hadn't been told by the employer or the member. Correct. And it might be that some fault lies with the employer or the member for that if they had an obligation to let REST know. Or it might be that in circumstances where it's REST's policy that has that effect, that the onus is on REST to ensure that its information is accurate. Do you accept that? Um, well, I certainly think, from what I have seen, um, REST certainly attempted to ensure its information was accurate. Can you see in 62 there it says we found that members were vulnerable in these situations because the consequences of changes to insurance could have significant ramifications and yet the member may be unaware of these changes? I can see that, yes. That's by definition what happens in a prescribed minimum balance clause, isn't it? Do you mean specifically in REST's policy when you say prescribed minimum account clause? I think I'd agree that um, there are ramifications to the member um, and they may have been unaware of the changes, yes. It's unlikely that a member with a low balance who ceases employment sets their stop clock for 71 days to know the period that they are retaining continued cover. I'd agree with that proposition, It's not realistic, yes. is it? It's the, sort of, it's the sort of clause that people involved with the policy, insurers and superannuation uh, administrators would be familiar with, but it would be unlikely in most cases that a consumer, a fund member, would have an awareness of the detailed operation of a clause like that. Do you agree? I think it's fair that um, most members probably don't have a detailed understanding um, of our insurance policy, yes. And these types of clauses have very significant effects on the cover available to the member. They determine whether there is cover or there is not cover. That's right. If I could take you to the next page of the ASIC document. Can you see there at 63, ASIC give an example? For example, to avoid eroding member benefits unnecessarily, trustees may have nominated a particular threshold for accounts so that if a member's account drops below this amount, cover will cease and premiums will no longer be deducted. This means that there is a designated point at which cover will cease without a member doing anything further. And then if we go further down to 67, disclosure about cover ceasing should occur at an appropriate time and in an appropriate way to have the best chance of being useful to the consumer in making decisions about their next steps in light of the change. See that? Yes. Do you agree with that? 
Um, I'm not sure the context it's seen in this document. Um, I, 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 in I, terms that it's impossible to disagree with, uh, is not Mr. Ross, and the real bite in the proposition is to know what's meant by appropriate, appropriate, uh, useful, etc. It's the, the loaded terms in there that do all the work and you don't quite know what work they're doing, do you? Not without turning my mind to it a bit more. No. Well, I think that may be what Mr Costello is asking you to do. I think that's a fair proposition, yes. Um, thank you. 67 to 70, ASIC gives some suggestions. Um, the first suggestion is that trustees trial different approaches to notifying members. How are members notified? Assume for present purposes in the example that we discussed, <clears throat> you were notified by the employer or the member that they had ceased employment. How then would you communicate the um, operation of the insurance policy to the member? Yes, we're going back to when this was um, in force. Um, as soon as Ressa's notified that, um, was notified that a member was no longer employed, it would write them a letter um, telling them as such and also to maintain their insurance cover um, they would need to maintain their account balance over the required threshold. How would you communicate that? By letter? By letter, yeah. In the mail? By yes. post? Yes. Yeah. And ASIC there suggests in 68 that trustees trial different approaches to notifying members using emails or text messages and consider the use of reminders to nudge behaviour. Has REST given any consideration to communicating with members in any way other than by post? We communicate with our members in lots of ways, yes. Okay. And about important changes to insurance status? Yes. How else do you do it? Well, um, if, you're, if you're referring again to the um, minimum account balance um, we're going back quite a way in time if we're talking about um, the death cover back to 2013 um, and for TPD and IP up to the end of 2017. Um, we may have communicated this to members um, by email at the time as well. I'm not sure though, Mr Casella. All right. Um, if we could go to the next page of that document, please. There's just one final paragraph I'd like to take you to. Can you see paragraph 72 there in the table below it? If trustees cannot be confident that they have timely and accurate information from employers or that disclosure can be provided to warn the member that cover will cease, they should consider whether, def whether defaults that rely on data from employers are appropriate given the needs of the membership base. Yes. Now this is a point that I was putting to you before that the obligation might be one on the employer or the employee, or it might ultimately be an obligation on REST as the owner of the policy and as the protector of the interests of the members of the fund. Are you aware of whether REST has given any consideration to whether... Sorry, are you aware at the time that these clauses existed whether REST gave any consideration to whether or not it was a, they were appropriate given the risk of having incorrect information about employment? Oh, I think clearly they did because the clause was removed. Is that one of the reasons the clause was removed? I was not involved um, in removing the clause, but I think I've seen the principles of certainty of cover and clarity. Um, Are you aware whether or not the removal of these types of clauses had a price effect on premiums? Um, I'm not aware, no. All right, thank you. Um, Commissioner, I tender that document. Yes, we should also, I think, <coughs> perhaps have uh, the AIA procedural fairness letter after planning to PD 10 November 17, RST 0011-0137 as exhibit 6.227. 
Exhibit 6.228 becomes ASIC Report 529, Member Experience of Superannuation, June 17, <coughs> RCD 0025-0003-0334, Exhibit 6.228. Um, Mr Ross, I want to discuss the particular circumstances of a claim <coughs> with you now. Um, it is a claim that you... Uh, it's the claim of a REST member that you've addressed in one of your witness statements. That is the one in answer to rubric 665. Yes. It is a, a REST member who became a paraplegic. You yes. know who I'm speaking of? Yes. Um, now, you would appreciate that there is a confidentiality a confidentiality order has been made that protects the name of that individual. So I'll just refer to that person as the member. Yes. But you know the case that I'm speaking of. I do. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> you explain... Can you just get the witness statement number for me for 665? You explain in your witness statement that um, the member became a member of REST on the 14th of June, 2005 and that was when the employer first made a contribution on the member's behalf? Yes. And from that date, the member had basic insurance cover? Yes. And then in December 2008, REST entered into a new group life policy with AIA. You recall that from your earlier witness statement? Um, and under that new policy, the member's coverage for both life and TPD increased? It did increase by a small amount, yes. Yes. Um, and the maximum amount potentially payable to the member under the 2008 policy um, at the time that the member became injured was $108,000. Do you recall that? Yes. Um, and the 2008 policy, as we've already seen, required a minimum balance of $3,000 to be maintained in order for continued cover? Yes. And REST sent communications to members before the 2008 policy came into effect. And one of those policies was the um, REST superannuation booklet. Yes. All right. I might just take you to that booklet quickly. It's LGR 17 to your witness statement 665. <coughs> its document ID is RST.0006. Dot triple zero one dot double zero three seven. Do you remember exhibiting this to your statement? Yes, I do. Um, so this is a communication that was sent to REST members before the changes came into effect. Yes. Um, advising them that a new policy would be in place and explaining what the insurance cover would be under the new policy. Yes. And is this the type of document that REST does whenever a new policy is entered into? Um, there were particularly significant changes at the time um, to REST insurance offering. All right. Um, if we j just move through that booklet, you'll see on the front there that the changes are effective from the 5th of December 2008. Yes. And then if we move to the um, third page... There's some introductory words, 0039, which explains why REST is communicating with the member. Yes. And then if we move two pages forward to 0041, there's a table about important features of REST insurance cover. Yes. And can you see uh, third from the bottom in the table, automatic transition to the new cover. Members who currently hold insurance will be automatically transferred to our new cover on 5 December 2008. Yes. And that's what happened to this member. Yes. And then there are many pages that explain different aspects of the coverage. If we go to 0045, there is the definition in the right-hand column of total and permanent disablement cover. Yes. And it explains there that um, it will guard against the financial costs associated with the occurrence of a serious permanent disability. And then it speaks of 
uh, the TPD benefit being changed to a flat $50,000 for most ages? Yes. In the second paragraph. Uh, this member didn't have $50,000 cover, though. No. Did, at this point in time, she had 100? Um, so members who had cover under different policy prior to 2008, um, when REST brought in this, like a significant changes to its insurance offering, um, there was a no worse off test for members. So if members had higher than $50,000 coverage prior to 2008, um, their cover was essentially matched and rounded up um, in 2008. I see. Um, now, there's then explanation of the cost of the levels of cover, of additional voluntary cover that members could take out, um, of the weekly rates for the voluntary cover, and how the changes will affect particular members. And this, the, the uh, member that we're speaking about here didn't have voluntary cover. It was just... She did not have voluntary cover prior to 2008. She was essentially on our systems given voluntary cover, although she did not have to apply for it in order to bring her coverage up um, to the level she had. I see. If I could take you to 0060. This is, this is the second page of section three, which is entitled, How the New Changes Affect You. And there's an example at the top there. Jennifer is 19 years old and is currently insured for basic cover. She does not have any voluntary cover. On 5 December 2008, she'll automatically move to our new insurance arrangements. As Jennifer's current death and TBD cover is higher than the new basic cover scale, she will receive top-up cover in the form of voluntary units of death and total and permanent disablement cover to ensure her benefit level is not reduced. That's what happened here. That's correct, yes. Thank you. There's then further explanation of the cover and inactive members. And when we get to page 29 of the document, it's section four, terms and conditions. And if we could go to 0067, which is the 31st page of the document. The right-hand column under the heading ceasing insurance is where we get to an explanation of continued cover and the prescribed minimum balance requirement. Yes, I can see that. And you can see in G, um, in the case of continued cover for members with TPD and or IP, continued cover, the date, of, the date your account balance falls below $3,000, that's when insurance ceases. Yes. Now, I just want to ask you some questions about REST's membership base. You're the default fund for a particular industry? That's been the history of REST, yes. Uh, it's the retail industry? Yes. And uh, a large number of your members are young members? Yes, that's fair. Um, each year you would have a reasonable inflow of new members entering the workforce for the first time? Yes. Um, and they are people who, by definition, are likely to have low account balances? Yes. Um, and not just in their first year, for some time, because these are people that are um, often working part-time? Part-time or casual, yes. Or casual? Yeah. Um, who are being paid hourly rates that aren't particularly high in many cases. Yes. Um, and so REST would have um, a reasonably high number of low balance accounts, I imagine. I think when compared to other funds, we probably do, yes. Yes. Um, and so a clause like the one we've been discussing um, might have greater scope for operation in a membership base like REST's where account balances might be low and where people might be more inclined to switch between employers or to have periods where they're no longer working for 
many and varied reasons. Do you agree with that? Oh, I mean, I think the clause was specifically written for rest because it was by rest. Um, your question Today being... by rest. Well, sorry, I mean, the, um, um, the specific insurance clause you're, you're referring to only applies to rest. It was the rest policy. Um, and rest does have, I would say, a reasonable higher proportion of um, low account balances. Um, so you might have to repeat your question to me, Mr Costello. And do you agree that it might also have members who are um, more likely than the general population to change jobs or to have periods outside of work? Yes. Thank you. So there's at least a reasonable amount of scope for a clause like this to operate in relation to a REST membership base. And if this clause was replicated for another fund, it might not be as likely to have as common an operation. Possibly. And do you know, did this clause come in at REST's request or is this an AIA clause? Um, I, I wasn't around back in 2008. Right. Um, but I'm, from what I've reviewed and from what I know about REST, the principle would have been to give as much coverage as possible to as many members as possible and to be able to cover um, casual and part-time employees who can have a lot of difficulty getting cover um, outside of their superannuation and, in fact, outside of REST. All right. Um, do you agree that for a young person entering the workforce for the first time, perhaps in a casual or part-time job that a 39-page booklet on superannuation is a lot to take in? It probably is, yes. And to get to page 31 and to learn at the foot of that page of the operation of a clause involving something called continued cover is at least possibly likely to be confusing. Possible, yes. Um, this member that you and I have been discussing um, worked for McDonald's between June 2005 and September 2010? Yes. And that's, again, not uncommon sort of a demographic for a new REST member? Not at all. Um, and the member then commenced work with another company called Swan Services sometime after September 2010? Yes. And on the 18th of May 2012, the member suffered a very serious injury <clears throat> by falling from the fifth floor of a building? Yes. And was rendered a paraplegic? Yes. And at the time of the member's injury, that is 18 May 2012, the member's most recent annual statement was the <clears throat> um, statement for the 2011 financial year? Yes. Um, and you have exhibited a number of statements, <clears throat> a number of annual statements um, for this member. Um, I'll take you to one. It's LGR 21 to your witness statement, which is RST.0013.0001. .0047. So this, in fact, is the 2012 statement, which is um, a couple of months after the injury. Yes. And you can see there um, that it explains that it's the annual statement and it gives some comparison on returns in the first page. And then <clears throat> if we go to the third page, there's the member's withdrawal benefit stated there, $1,550. Uh, yes. And then... If we go to 0052, there's the statement of insurance cover. 
and you can see the TPD referring to is stated as being $108,000 plus the withdrawal benefit for a total of $109,550.43. Yes. Um, so this member would have received this statement um, about three months, three and a half months after suffering the injury? Yeah, prob probably in um, September. Right, perhaps four months after suffering the injury. And um, this is what the member would have understood to be the insurance coverage based on the statement. Agree with that? I, I don't know what the member would have understood, but that's certainly the statement they received. Yeah, this is what was conveyed by REST to the member as to the extent of insurance coverage. This was the statement we sent them, yes. Thank you. And are you aware if within this statement there is any reference to the minimum balance requirement? Um, I don't believe there's a specific reference to dollar amounts, no. Can I take you to 0055? Can you see there in um, blue in the middle of the first column it says insured benefits? Yes. And it says the insured benefit shown on your statement reflects rest records and is not a representation that you're insured. And then it has the statement about um, receiving contributions from your employer. And it then says in the second paragraph, REST relies on you and your employer to keep us up to date on your employment status at all times. If you or your employer do not notify us of your employment status or changes to your employment status, your statement may reflect a level or type of cover to which you are not entitled. Yes. So that's the warning about the earlier statement made about $108,000 worth of coverage. It's conditioned by that warning a few pages later. Yes. Um, but there's nothing in the paragraphs there under insured benefits about a prescribed minimum balance. No, there is not. And why was that the case? I don't know, Mr Casello. Should there have been? Um, I mean, possibly. I think it's a balance. Um, um, you know, the more information you put in there, um, the more information the member needs to absorb. Um, so at some you know, need to strike a balance and give what you think is the relevant information. Um, so you answer the question, possibly. Well, REST's position was ultimately that this member had no TPD insurance at the time of the injury, wasn't it? Um, I think it's a yes, but I think it's slightly more nuanced um, in that um, the claim was eventually paid um, and REST supported that position as well. Yes. Um, but for some time at least, both REST and AIA were of the view that there was no coverage at the time. Yes. And in those circumstances, the bare statement of $108,000 worth of TPD coverage, if taken alone and not read together with these uh, paragraphs later on in the document would be misleading to the member. If the member didn't pay careful attention to the document, the member would fall into error and think that 108000 was the amount of cover. Quite possibly. Thank you. The member couldn't find out, even by reading this policy diligently, about the <coughs> prescribed minimum balance clause. How would the member know about that? Um, it would be disclosed, um, just thinking the time period here, um, it would be disclosed in the product disclosure statement. Um, I believe it was disclosed in that um, document you took me to earlier. Yes, it was. Yes. When, when is a product disclosure statement sent to a member? Uh, when they join. So uh, 
the member could either have had regard to a document that would have been sent in June 2005, when membership first commenced, um, or could have had regard to the document that I took you to from 2008. Yes. Um, so if sh the member had excellent record keeping, go back to either of those two documents, but otherwise wouldn't be aware of this clause. Is that right? Um, not if we were um, under the belief that they were still employed, um, which is the case here, I accept. Um, if an employer had let us know, or the member had let us know, employer had let us know, um, we would have communicated um, with the member that there was an important account balance um, that they should be aware of. Do you think it was unrealistic? Would it have been unrealistic to expect that a member would have retained the booklet from 2008? I, I don't know. You don't know? No. I, I... Do you know how old this member was at the time? I believe she was in her um, mid-twenties. At the time of the injury? Yes. 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 Um, on the 18th of July 2014, REST submitted the member's claim to AIA for assessment? Yes. Um, do you recall when the member submitted the claim to REST? Um, I don't believe the member did submit it. I think it was um, submitted by um, a lawyers representing the member. Um, uh, from memory um, in January. Why? Uh, stand to be corrected there, Mr. No, Smart. You, you're quite right. Um, the member, the member's claim, whether submitted directly by the member or by somebody on the member's behalf, was submitted to uh, rest in January uh, 2014. Why did it take until the 18th of July 2014 for rest to? send the member's claim to AIA? Um, so our administrators were collecting um, the relevant information um, for AIA to be able to make their assessment. What sort of information? I think they were waiting for quite some time for employment records. Right. Is that sort of a delay in, in excess of six months acceptable? So in excess of six months? Um, I, I think it took too long. Um, I took you to the insurance code earlier. Yes. There was a reference to five days. Yes. Um, and I asked you if you were complying with that at the moment, and I think your answer was you're not, but you try and do these things as quickly as you can. Would Is six months an outlier? So we're... I mean, this is um, quite some time ago. Um, I don't know what the time periods were. Um, back in um, 2014, I think we're in, aren't we, Mr Costello? Yes. Yes. Um, would six months be unusual now? Absolutely. Um, the claim in any event eventually got to AIA on, uh, in July 2014, and AIA then took some months to assess the claim. Yes. And it sought information from REST at various times. Do you recall that? Yes. Um, and... Do you recall that AIA had to follow up REST on a couple of occasions to get information that it was seeking to use in assessing the claim? Um, at, that, at that point in time, um, the administrator basically managed the collection of information. So typically AIA would um, follow them up if there was outstanding information. The administrator here is AAS? That's correct, yes. And... Um, Eventually, that information was provided to the insurer, and on the 21st of November, AAI, uh, sorry, AIA, AIA. Um, emailed REST, and yes. I'll just take you to that document. You've annexed it to your statement. It's LGR 38. The document ID is rst.0010.0003.2014. So this is a communication from AIA to, I think, 
AAS on behalf of REST. Because can you see there in the two line it says yes. AAS.com. That's correct, yeah. Um, but in any event, it's addressed to REST and it says, Dear REST, in regards to the above claim, please note the assessment has been completed and based on this assessment, we have made the decision to admit liability on the claim. Yes. The assessment decision was based on the following information and there's reference to two medical reports. The assessment decision was based on the relevant date of 18 May 2012, which is when TPD was certified by one of the doctors. Yes. And if you have any queries, don't hesitate to contact me. It also says, based on the above, we've remitted a TPD benefit of $108,000. Yes. And that was the fact. A uh, um, REST, in fact, received $108,000 into its account. Correct. And that's the usual process that you explained before, that um, REST receives claims paid out by the insurer, and that claim is then that amount is then deposited to the member's superannuation account and there is then a decision taken by REST about whether it's appropriate to release those funds from the superannuation account. Is that right? Correct. Thank you. Um, but that didn't happen here, did it? No, it was not released in this case, no. Um, Can I take you please to exhibit 41 to your statement, which is rst.0010.0003.0101.0001 Now, this is an email by REST's administrator to the insurer on the 4th of December. So, so, a couple of weeks after the $108,000 has been sent to REST. Yes. And it says, good afternoon. <clears throat> Due to continued cover rules from 5 December 2010, members TPD and IP insurance ceased <clears throat> as balance was less than $3,000. Please review claim and determine if decline claim refund of $108,000 will be organised and a separate email will be sent. Yes. Why would REST's administrator consider it appropriate to form a view about whether or not an exclusion within the policy operated? I don't believe... Um, I don't know if this was the first communication. They realised there had been an administration mistake. By? By themselves. Sorry, do you mean AAS formed the view there had been a, an administration mistake? Yes. And what was that mistake? Um, that employment records that had been sent to AAS um, had not been correctly entered into the system. Where were those employment records from? Um, this member's employer. But which employer? McDonald's. And because, it, and relevantly, it was information about the date the, the member had ceased working for McDonald's. That's correct. So AAS became aware of that, that it, there, there'd been an error, and it then took it upon itself to refund the money that had been paid and to call upon the insurer to review the claim to see whether or not the prescribed minimum balance clause operated to preclude the member from being paid? Seemingly, yes. And is it ordinarily part of REST's administrator's role to try and ascertain whether or not a member falls within an, an exclusion? Um, I'm not familiar with the, um, all the procedures at the time. Um, Are you aware that under the Superannuation Industry Supervision Act, REST has an obligation to do everything that is reasonable to pursue an insurance claim for the benefit of a beneficiary if the claim has a reasonable prospect of success? Yes. 
that's REST's obligation. Yes. And that's an obligation that it performs in part through the appointment of its administrator. Yes. And in this circumstance, the administrator, rather than doing the work of pursuing the claim for the member, has identified an error to the possible advantage of the insurer and refunded the money without notice to the member. Is that correct? Um, I th the, the money has been refunded without notice to the member, yes. And the member hadn't been informed that the insurer had formed the view that the claim should be accepted? I do not believe they were, no. And was that appropriate way for AAS to behave? Um, I believe it was, yes. Without notice to the member? Um, yes, I do. But let me just test that a little bit. You explained that the error that AAS had made was an error concerning the date employment with McDonald's had ceased. Is that correct? Correct. And let me take you to RS... Uh, this is Exhibit 27 to your statement, which is RST.0005.0001. Dot four six seven six. This is the claim form that was submitted on the member's behalf. Yes. And it's submitted to rest. Yes. And that claim form, if we go to four six seven nine. Section E, occupation details, name of current or last employer, Swan Services. Yes. See that? Yes. So this was a document in REST's possession at the time. Yes. And would this have been a document in AAS's possession at the time? Yes. And the member has stated that their employer is Swan Services, not McDonald's. Yes. So why would the date that employment ceased with McDonald's be determinative of whether the member's claim should be accepted? Um, this goes back to the issue we were talking about some time ago with the REST employer. Um, so what is important in the policy is who is the employer that was making contributions on behalf of the member to REST? And I do not believe any contributions were ever received from Swan Services for this member. But shouldn't AAS have investigated why that was the case? And I believe they did. Hence, the, we were talking before about why it may have taken some period of time um, for the claim to be presented to the insurer. And my understanding is um, quite a period of that was trying to follow up information about Swan Services. If we skip forward a little bit, it's the case, isn't it, that this member was employed by Swan Services? Yes. But what had happened was Swan Services was not paying the compulsory contributions that they were required by law to pay. I don't know that. You don't know that? No. Are you aware that Swan Services went into liquidation? Yes. Um, and you're aware that this member was employed by Swan Services? Yes. And did work for Swan Services? I believe so. And was paid by Swan Services? I believe so. And would you understand that to create an obligation in Swan Services to pay compulsory contributions? Yes. And you're aware that those compulsory contributions were not paid? No, I'm not. They were not paid to rest, um, but they may have been paid, they may not have been paid. I don't think we ever um, got any pay slips from Swan Services even. Yes. So rest never asked, rest, what rest knew definitely was that it did not receive contributions on this member's behalf from Swan Services. Yes. And you say now what rest still doesn't know is whether or not Swan Services in fact paid another fund. Yes. And is there any way that REST could have ascertained that? Well, I believe they did try their best. They, they talked, um, they tried to follow up Swan Services on multiple occasions. Um, they sent communications to um, the member's representative um, asking for information on Swan Services. Um, can I take you please to 
Exhibit 28 to your witness statement, which is RST.0005.0001.4913.2020. Do you remember exhibiting this to your witness statement? Yes. And you've read this uh, statement? Um, I have, but not recently. Uh, sorry, this, I, I called it a statement. I meant this article? Yes. Um, and this article explains that the member's employer was placed into liquidation and yes. it owed $1.6 million to 2,466 employees for wages alone? Yes. Um, and there's discussion there of the expectation of the liquidator about whether or not those claims could be paid and how they could be paid. So given that, and given that you know that, it would be unsurprising, wouldn't it, if this member had not been paid her compulsory superannuation contributions by this employer who owed millions of dollars to its staff. Um, I, I just didn't think there's any way I can know that, Mr Costello. Do you ever have... Does REST ever have the experience of an employer failing to, make, to pay compulsory contributions? Yes. And does that experience include sometimes circumstances where a company ultimately goes into liquidation? Yes. And is that experience, does that experience extend to... Um, being aware of circumstances where companies in financial difficulty cease paying compulsory contributions as one of the first payments that they stop making I would to agree. improve their own cash flow. I would agree with that. None yes. of that would be surprising to you, would it? No, it would not. But w why do you constantly resist my characterisation that it would not be unlikely that this member was not paid what she was entitled to? Oh, I think it's quite possible. And you don't have... The REST has no evidence to suggest that there was any amount paid to this member to any other superannuation fund? No. no. So why then, when AAS determined that the employer had finished working at McDonald's at an earlier point in time, but when REST knew that the employer... that there, there was a new employer and knew the name of that employer... Yes. ..why would it then be assumed that the... Um, clause would operate so that the 71 days counted from the day that she that the member stopped working at McDonald's? I don't think it was assumed. Um, rest, I'll, I'll get back to the definition of an employer in the policy. It's an employer that makes, um, this is from memory, um, compulsory um, contributions on behalf of a member to rest. So unless REST has received a compulsory contribution, um, I can't understand how the employer would be characterised as a REST employer. And that's a clause that creates a double detriment to REST's member because not only does the REST member forego a compulsory contribution to which there's a legal entitlement, insurance coverage is also foregone. Um, I don't agree with that proposition because, like I say, I, 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 it's possible um, no superannuation guarantee contributions were paid for this employer, um, but I've no way to know that or not. Well, you know none were paid to you? This is correct, yes. And you've got an obligation to know about multiple accounts? As far as we can tell, yes. And none of the information that you have available to you suggests that this member had multiple superannuation accounts? Um, I am aware that this member did have other superannuation I've become aware in preparing for this that they did, yes. At the date? Um, at which date? Well, at the relevant date for claiming under the policy. Uh, yes. And who was that fund with? Um, I can remember one of them. Um, I believe it was Australian Super. I cannot remember the other one. So it couldn't have been easier then to find out whether or not this member had been paid, could it? This um, <coughs> became apparent at a much later stage um, during litigation. I see. 
as a consequence of REST's or AAS's correspondence to uh, the insurer, AA, AIA gave further consideration to the claim. Yes. And ultimately determined that the claim should be declined. Yes. And that decline had nothing to do with the extent of the injury suffered by the member? Correct. It was the operation of prescribed minimum balance clause and continued cover? Yes. Um, and then in April 2015, REST wrote to the member's solicitors and advised of the insurer's decision? Yes. And I might just take you to that document. It's um, Exhibit 43 to your statement, which is RST.0010.0003.0001. You might recall that it was in January that AIA determined the claim should be declined. Do you recall that? Yes. Um, and then in April, this letter was sent by REST. And what happens in the gap between AIA notifying REST and REST notifying the member? So what happens in the gap between, did you say AIA notifying REST and REST, and REST notifying, notifying the member that's right. of the fact that the claim had been declined. <coughs> um, so this isn't actually the um, final notice that the claim has been declined. This is a letter informing um, the member that AA has declined the claim. Um, I don't believe REST had conducted its review by this point. The moment. document needs to come down. It's not redacted properly. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, that document that document informs the um, member of the fact that the insurer has come to a view. The insurer has declined the claim at that point, yes. And um, that there is an opportunity for a review process. That the trustee will review the claim, yes. And. I'll just read the relevant paragraph to you that you're referring to. Please note that this decision is not the final outcome of your client's claim. We will now refer the claim to the trustee for an independent review. In doing so, your client's claim will undergo a full and independent assessment and all evidence provided will be considered. Following this review, the trustee may disagree with AIA's decision and refer the claim back for further assessment. Yes. That's the process? Yes. Um, do you think there's something a little contradictory in telling the members' solicitors that the trustees will review the decision in circumstances where the insurer's decision has been made at the suggestion of the trustee? No. I don't believe the insurer's decision was made at the suggestion of the trustee. The insurer had made a decision and had paid the claim. The trustee then drew the insurer's attention to facts and to a particular clause and asked to advise whether or not it would be declined and refunded the money? Um, the insurer's decision was made with their preliminary, de the initial decision was made um, with incorrect information. But that's not my question. My question to you was, is it a little contradictory to suggest that the, that the trustee will review the claim in circumstances where it was the trustee that identified the basis on which the claim should be denied? Well, it was the administrator that communicated with the insurer. Um, the trustee's review of the claim would encompass everything that had taken place. So I don't think it's contradictory, no. You don't think it was contradictory? No. The um, administrator is the agent of the trustee? Yes. What the administrator does, it does in the name of the trustee. Yes. And it was because of the intervention of the administrator that the claim was denied. Do you agree with that? Um, yes. But you don't think it's contradictory then in those circumstances to suggest that the trustee would disagree with the decision that had been come to by the insurer at the trustee's suggestion? So 
Sorry, can you rephrase that for me? The insurer came to a decision that was suggested to it by the trustee. No, I think the insurer came to a decision after reviewing the additional information that was provided to it. That was suggested to it by the trustee. Um, I think the trustee had explained to the insurer their view, but the insurer would have come to their own decision. But the trustee was sufficiently confident about it that it didn't just say, would you like to have another look at it? It refunded the money that had been paid for the benefit of the member. Yes. Are you seriously suggesting that this trustee would look at that conduct and then engage in an argument with the insurer about the correctness of the decision that was taken at the suggestion of the trustee? If they thought it was an incorrect decision, they would. Then why would they think it was an incorrect decision? After reviewing all the evidence, um, the trustee comes to an independent view. And the trustee got it wrong again, didn't it? Uh, no, I don't believe they did. You don't think the trustee did get it wrong? At what point? At this point, when it did the review? No. You think the trustee was right in affirming the decision of the insurer to decline the claim? I think on the evidence available to the trustee at that point in time, yes. All right. And do you think that the trustee ultimately came to the correct decision? What decision do you refer to? Paying the member's claim. Yes. And why was that the correct decision? Um, new medical evidence was presented to the trustee, well, the insurer, um, during the course of litigation. And save for that, you think the decision would have been right? Yes. All right. The initial, uh, the further medical evidence that came to the attention of the trustee was uh, medical evidence concerning a mental health condition. Yes. Um, and that mental health condition um, had been uh, present in the member for from an earlier point in time. Yes. And that fact is stated in the member's claim form that I've already taken you to. Yes. So that po that fact was known to the trustee at all times. Uh, which particular fact? The fact that the person suffered from a mental health condition from an earlier date. Yes. So why did it take litigation in the Supreme Court of New South Wales before the trustee recognised that that might be a basis for a claim? Um, I think this is a very unusual case in that the member has been deemed to be totally and permanently disabled um, prior to them ceasing work. So as we've already agreed, um, the member worked for Swan Services. That was ultimately after the date that the um, insurer decided the trustee, the member was totally and permanently, permanently disabled, which is very unusual. Commissioner, I see the time. I, I think I... I th Inspector require. I, I think I have another half an hour. I have to bring you back on uh, Monday morning. I'm, uh, sorry about that, but... It's OK. Uh, it's been a long week. Uh, if we if we were to begin at what nine thirty? Thank you, Commissioner. That would be very helpful. Uh, is that going to be unduly inconvenient to everybody? I know it's not convenient, but is it going to be unduly inconvenient if I say nine thirty Monday morning? Uh, not to me, Commissioner. No, well, Commissioner. You're the one who matters. Yes. Council, <laughs> alas, don't get a look in at that point. <laughs> nine thirty uh, Monday morning. Thank you, Commissioner. Yes, Mr. Costello. Continuing with Mr. Ross, Commissioner. Um, Mr. Ross, you'll recall on Friday we were discussing the case of arrest member who was rendered paraplegic after a fall. I recall, yes. And um, I took you to the employee's claim form which listed Swan Services as her employer. Yes. And I took you to a document that showed that um, Rest's Group Life Insurer AIA had accepted the claim at one point in time at least 
um, and that REST's administrator, AAS, suggested the insurer should perhaps review that decision because of the operation of a prescribed minimum balance clause in operation with um, another definition relating to when she'd ceased working. Yes. And central to the administrator's reasoning was the date the member had ceased working at McDonald's. Yes. Do you accept that in circumstances where REST had information that indicated that McDonald's was not the member's last employer, that it or AAS should have conducted further investigations before sending correspondence to the insurer suggesting the claim might be denied? Um, from my understanding, the um, double S had already conducted um, quite thorough investigations into whether they could get any information from Swan Services. And I believe um, the insurer had also requested information about Swan Services prior to the claim being accepted. Do you think that the member was entitled to be contacted and asked for further information before that type of communication was sent to the insurer? Sorry, when you say um, information sent to the insurer, what point are you referring to? I'm referring to the email from AAS where it suggested the insurer might change its decision. I believe um, the member had been contacted on multiple occasions prior to that requesting information on Swan Services. Do you accept that in, pardon me, in the circumstances of this case, REST failed to do everything that was reasonable to pursue this member's claim? Absolutely not. Do you think that in circumstances where the member's claim identified a serious mental health condition that manifested some years before her physical injury, REST ought to have sought to better understand that condition and whether it was relevant to a TPD claim? Um, I think it's a complicated question. Um, well, sorry, maybe a complicated answer. Um, I think REST did do everything um, that it should have done. I think a couple of aspects were um, the member's age. Um, she was very young. It is rare for someone in their mid-20s to be so disabled um, that they are unlikely to ever work again. Um, another um, more unusual circumstance in this case it is very unusual for someone to be so disabled they are unlikely to ever work again and then to in fact work again, which was what happened here. So lots of inquiries were made um, about the member's uh, medical history and a decision was made on the evidence that the insurer and REST had. Um, subsequent to that, other evidence was provided but I think at that point in time, in 2015, it was absolutely the correct decision um, to decline the claim. Was it acceptable that the member had to commence proceedings in the New South Wales Supreme Court in order to have her claim properly determined? Um, the member did not have to commence proceedings in the Supreme Court to have her claim properly determined. Um, she chose to. Well, what was the outcome of that proceeding? Um, the claim was admitted, well, the claim was settled, um, but the reason it was settled was because evidence was provided that had not been provided prior to the insurer or to REST. Did REST contribute to that settlement? Um, no. It was paid by the insurer? Yes. Reflecting on REST's conduct as a whole, including the fact that a Supreme Court proceeding was commenced and settled and the effect of the settlement was that the member's claim was paid out, in fact paid out for an amount higher than the total recoverable under the insurance policy. I believe it included um, costs and some other expenses, yes. Reflecting on all of that, do you think that at any point REST failed to act in the best interest of this member? Um, with hindsight, um, I wish we had done more, but at every point in time when um, REST reviewed it, I think the correct um, decisions were made. Um, but in any case like this, um, you know, looking back with the benefit of hindsight, um, I wish we could have got the benefit to the member sooner because REST is only interested in providing 
um, benefits to members who are entitled to them. Part of the problem in all of this was record keeping. Do you agree with that? Um, there were some um, mistakes made which were preventable due to record keeping, yes. And does that, did that in part result from REST having a, a manual system that required forms to be completed by hand and submitted to REST at that, by, by employers? that point in time? Um, the mistake in this case, the error in this case, um, I don't think was on the part of the employer or the information that was provided. It was when that information arrived um, to rest, there was human error in the data entry. Right. Um, is it the case that employers in updating um, rest as to whether or not employees are continuing to work for them have to manually submit, complete and submit forms to REST? Um, so when we go, as, as we've talked about, that's no longer the case, um, that it's, a, that insurance hinges upon that or not. Um, at that point in time, um, there were multiple ways employers could provide information to us. Um, that would have ranged from um, automatic data being provided to us through SuperStream um, to very small employers who may well have sent us a cheque and written information on the back of it. But the majority of information, for, especially from large employers, um, would have come through a data file at the time. So was the information that you'd received from McDonald's received in a timely way but just not input to, into REST system in a correct way? The information we received from McDonald's was gained um, when we contacted them specifically about this member um, when they claimed. It was provided by McDonald's in a timely way. It was not input um, when it was received in a timely way. But, but it wasn't provided by McDonald's in a timely way compared to when she ceased working for them? This is correct. We only became aware um, when we made inquiries um, when the um, member claimed. At the time the member claimed, REST's records were no longer correct because they'd not been updated by the employer or by the member? This is correct, yes. Thank you. Um, I just want to close off on uh, TPD claims with some more general questions not relevant to the particular member that we've been speaking about. Um, would you agree that TPD clauses in group life policies can be quite complex? Um, I think they are probably the most complex of insurance offered in group life because um, the test that needs to be considered um, is a complicated test as to whether someone is capable of working um, ever again. Yes, I might just take you to um, Exhibit 3 to your witness statement 641. Uh, the document ID for that exhibit is rst.0006.0001.0001. This is the current group life policy that I've taken you to before. Yes. And if we could please go to 0679. <coughs> There's a definition there, a bit above the middle of the page, of gainful employment. Ah, uh, yes. Means being employed for gain or reward in any business, trade, profession or employment for at least 10 hours per week. Yes. And that's a clause of relevance to uh, the TPD definition, which yes. I'll now take you to. That's on page 0681. You can see there the heading total and permanent disablement, totally and permanently disabled. And um, in the box, there's an explanation of the way the clause works. Relevantly, if the member has been in gainful employment at any time during the 13 months prior to the incident, there are three parts of the definition of TPD that might potentially be engaged. That is correct. If the member has not been in gainful employment at any time for the 13 months prior, then only parts two or parts three will be engaged. That is correct, yes. And it's the same, only parts two or three will be engaged if a person has not returned to work 
um, for example, having been on paternity leave? Yes. All right. Um, and then if that box could come down, please. Um, we can then see underneath part one, and part two and part three is on the other page. Part one's the easiest um, part of the clause to satisfy. Um, I, I, I think I understand what you're saying. Um, clauses part two and three are actually the easiest to satisfy. Part one is the most commonly tested. Um, I say that because um, there is less um, judgment and assessment required for parts two and three. You're right that two and three are, well, at least two is more objectively ascertainable. Yes. And three perhaps as well, although there might be some room for debate in three. Yes, yes. And um, part one is something that requires an expert judgment. It requires an assessment more so than two or three, yes. Yes. Um, but it might be that one could satisfy part one with, without having an injury of the severity that would be necessary to engage part two or part three? Yes. Thank you. And if we look then to part one, this is the part that applies if somebody is in gainful employment. Um, there's a succession of requirements. The first is that the member has been absent from employment for three consecutive months because of the sickness or injury. Yes. And then is so disabled at the start of those three months and continuously since that time that the insured member is unlikely to ever engage in any reasonably suitable occupation. Yes. So that's the test for somebody who is in, in gainful employment within the meaning of this clause at the time they were injured. Yes. In, in effect it is that they couldn't, having been unwell for three months and unable to work, they're unable to return to their chosen profession or something close to it. Yeah, unable to return to um, work essentially ever, um, given their education they've had, any training they've received and their general experience. Yes, thank you. If we could then move to part two. Somebody who hasn't been in gainful employment will need to meet part two or part three. Yes. Um, it's either a part two or part three? That is correct, yes. Um, so for part two, this is the one that you and I agreed was objectively ascertainable, a person will only be entitled to a TPD payment <coughs> if they've lost the use of two hands, two feet, one hand and one foot, the sight in both eyes, one hand and the sight in one eye, or one foot and the sight in one eye. Yes. And any other injury, however severe, not meeting those particular requirements will not come within the meaning <coughs> of the second limb of this clause. Yes. So for somebody who suffered a serious injury but doesn't meet one of those uh, six tests, they would then need to fall to part three? Yes. All right, and I'll take you now to part three. Which is at the top of 0682. So in that circumstance, the member will have to have become so disabled by bodily injury or illness uh, that the member will never be able to perform at least two of the following activities of daily living. And this is a clause that is not uncommon in group life policies, uh, a clause that requires an activities of daily living test to be satisfied. I believe that to be so, yes. Um, and the activities of daily living in this particular clause are dressing, bathing, toileting, mobility, meaning get in and out of bed in a chair without assistance, and feeding. Yes. Do you accept that a rest member could be very seriously injured and unable to return to their chosen profession or something equivalent to it, but because they don't come within the definition of gainful employment, be not be entitled to a TPD payment? Um, I mean, it is possible that someone who... Um is ill or injured will not necessarily meet parts two or three. They could be quite seriously ill or seriously injured and still not able to meet it. Um, I guess um, it'd be helpful, I think, if you give me an example, but potentially, yes. Well, um, for part three, you've got to not be able to perform two of those functions. Um, and for example, examples that um, have come up 
not necessarily in respect of rests, but in respect of others, uh, where there has been a debate about whether a person is capable of feeding themselves if they're unable to cut their food, but if the food once cut, that they're capable of using a fork to feed themselves. That's an example of somebody who may fall foul on some views of um, the feeding test. That person would be held to be capable of feeding themselves. Um, I guess for um, parties other than REST potentially, um, if that was the case at REST, that would be independently reviewed by the trustee and I'd suggest we'd have a strong view on that matter. You would take that up on the member's behalf with the insurer if the insurer formed the view that a person in that situation was uh, was incapable of feeding themselves? Quite possibly, yes. Right. Um, and your team is the team that reviews all declined claims? Yes. And do you see many declined claims based on part two or part three of the definition of TPD? Um, not many, no. Not many. Do you know how many you'd see a year? Um, I believe... Um, I answered this question in my witness statement um, as to death and TPD declines in the five-year period on the basis of gainful employment. Um, I could search for it if you'd like. That's all right. Um, I, it was very few from memory. I'll come back to it because it's relevant in the context of some other questions that I want to ask you now about income protection insurance. Yes. Um, REST provides its members with income protection cover? Yes, we do. All members? Um, it is part of the um, default insurance that a member would receive um, when we receive a contribution on their behalf. Thank you. Um, is it a form of insurance cover that's particularly valuable to REST's member demographic? It certainly is, yes. Um, under the REST group life policy, an income protection benefit is payable, um, and when it is payable, it's calculated by reference to the member's pre-disability income? That is correct, yes. So if the pre-disability income was nil, necessarily the income protection benefit is nil? That is correct, yes. Does REST have any processes in place to detect whether members are unemployed? Um, in so much as an employer um, would let us know or the member would let us know, um, yes, we would. Um, save for the employer or employee letting you know, is there any way that REST would detect that? Um, not that I'm aware of, no. Um, and that means that a member in that situation will continue to be charged premiums for income protection insurance? Hypothetically, yes. And you've already agreed with me that a person in that circumstance would not be entitled to any payment? Yes. Do you think that in those circumstances that the income protection insurance becomes a junk insurance product? Um, I, no, I, didn't, I, I don't believe it is. Um, you know, the principle that REST takes is to provide what it believes is a very valuable insurance to all members, if possible. Um, now, there will be cases where, because we're not aware of information, um, there may not be a benefit payable, but I certainly don't think, um, you know, the insurance we offer could possibly be classified as junk insurance. Um, at paragraph 51 of your statement in answer to rubric 641, You've stated that 37 member claims were declined for income protection insurance because the member was unemployed. Um, could you take me to that yes, part of my statement, please? Yes, I can. Thank you. Is that 641? It's um, the witness statement in answer to rubric 641. It's wit.0001.0144.0001. <coughs> And um, if we could please move to paragraph 54, sorry, 51. Yeah. 
would you like to see the whole of that page rather than the blown up paragraph? Um, thank you. Sorry, could you ask me the question again? I said that at paragraph 51 of your statement, statement you've stated that 37 claims were declined because the member was unemployed. Um, could we please go to 42A? Yes. Just go to page 4014. Um, that actually refers to um, what we were talking to on Friday, where there is a combination of um, a member's account balance and their um, employment status. Right. So that is that would be declined on a similar basis to what we were discussing about the previous claim this morning. Thank you. Um, and while we're in this document, could we please go to 0011? Um, actually, in fairness to you, Mr Ross, I might take you a page before that to 0010. This is a discussion I hope you can see there about um, death and TPD claims. It is. Um, and you recall that you said to me before that you'd put in your statement the figures for declined claims. Yes, could I clarify with this one here? This um, definition we've included here is actually in relation to um, a product um, rest house called Rest Select. Mm -hmm which is not our default product, and we had um, one declined claim in the five-year period, um, and that's why we've included... Um, in respect the, of that product. In respect of this page here with the at-work yes. definition, that is specifically relating to the REST Select product. Thank you. Where there was one decline in the five-year period. Thank you. And then you'll see at the foot of that page there's a heading declined claim figures. Yes. And if we go over the page, please, to 0011... You'll see in paragraph 32 you say during the five year relevant period the prescribed employment status requirements referred to in paragraphs 18 to 31 above led by reason of the application of different policy conditions to 224 insured death or TPD benefit claims being declined. In no cases did they lead to an amount of the benefit being reduced. Yes. And is that a reference to the gainful employment definition that we were speaking of in connection with TPD claims? No. 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 The 224 um, is in reference to um, the combination of um, the account balance and employment status, I believe. Um, and, and isn't gainful employment... Gainful employment, employment is included in those 224. Yes, thank you. Yes, yes, that's what I was putting to you. Yes. So within that 224 include claims that have been denied on the basis of the gainful employment definition. Yes, a subset Not exclusively is. those, but that is, that yes. is, some of those are those. Thank you. Um, Mr. Just, just for, I, I don't want to give a wrong answer, but it's in the vicinity of 10 to 20 from memory were from gainful employment. And what was the balance then? What um, made up the balance of the 224? It would have been um, the... combination of the prescribed um, or the account balance and um, employment status and also um, I believe we're in the right part of the statement here um, what rest refers to as um, an act the active employment part of its policy thank you uh, mr. Ross do you agree that simple terms and clear exclusions are preferable to complex terms and confusing exclusions in group life policies um, I do, as long as they balance with, um, in REST case, being able to provide meaningful cover. But I, yes, I agree with your proposition. Do you think that simplicity of expression and clearness of operation is more important in the group life context because the member doesn't have somebody advising them about the policy? Um, yes. Thank you. And... It's also important because for many people, 
group life insurance will be the only form of life insurance they hold? Yes. Do you think that there would be any benefit in there being universal definitions for group life policies for key terms and exclusions? Um, I think um, theoretically yes um, would be my answer to that. Um, but how that would work in practice, um, I don't know. But I think there's merit to that in theory, yes. Thank you. Do you agree that it's important for trustees and group life insurers to communicate key terms and exclusions to members? Yes, I do. And do you think that it is important that that be done more than once? Um, depending on what the, um, needs to be communicated, potentially, yes. It's important that employers and employees are aware that changes to their status might affect their rights? Yes. And finally, given that REST and other superannuation trustees have an obligation to do everything reasonable to pursue a member's claim, should group life policy owners have staff dedicated to that task? That is somebody who is expressly in the member's corner to pursue the claim against the insurer? Um, well, I can't speak on behalf of other um, parties, but REST certainly believes so and does. And what team do those people sit within at REST? That's my team. That's your team? Yes. And the role of the people in your team is to advocate for the member? Yes. And is that something that is made known to the administrator engaged by REST? Yes. I have no further questions for this witness. Thank you. Mr. Stolger. Uh, no re-examination. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ross. You may step down. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner, before um, Mr. Stolger leaves the bar table, there are three further witness statements from uh, REST tendered on behalf of, sorry, provided on behalf of REST that I wish to tender. Yes. The first is a witness statement of Natalie Binns in answer to rubric 641. The statement is dated the 31st of August 2018 and its document ID is WIT.0001.0145.0001. That becomes exhibit 6.229. Second is the witness statement of Mr Paul Howard in answer to rubric 665, dated the 7th of September 2018, WIT.0001.0155.0001. Becomes exhibit 6.230. The third is a witness statement of Mr Joseph de Bruin sworn in answer to rubric 5.64 and dated the 12th of September 2018. It is WIT.0001. Dot zero one six four dot triple zero one. Exhibit six point two three one. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner, the next case study involves AMP. If we could adjourn for a brief moment to reconstitute the bar table. I come back at five past. Thank you, Commissioner. Yes.